Part 1 of Geraldine Dewsbury in Gerald Schilling Magazine, 1846 to 1847. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Today, published in Gerald Schilling Magazine, Volume 3, Number 15. The most striking feature in the present day, far more than that of railways even, is the utter chaos into which all previously received principles and opinions are reduced. There is no recognised rule of faith. All that for 1800 years served the world for moral principles are, as it were, withdrawn from circulation to be resolved afresh into their elements and prove their authority. They must speak intelligibly in the dialect of today, or the spirit that is in them will not appeal to the hearts and wants of men, will not serve them to shape their conduct by, in the clashing of interests and the turmoil of active life. Every day, every hour, is, for each one of us, filled with passionate details which hurry us along without our seeing too clearly whither they lead. And it needs something stronger, larger than they, all sympathising, all pervading, to form a rule of life to which we may each one of us continually resort in all seasons of perplexity and difficulty. Nothing one-sided, nothing of limited sympathy, nothing, in short, that is sectarian, will answer the requirements of a rule to guide and counsel all men in the varied phases of life as it is developed in each. For the last three hundred years, men have been breaking loose from the rock to which aforetime they were anchored, and have resolved themselves into sects and religions, and shades of religion and no religion, each one trying to construct an ark for the saving of his own soul out of the wreck and fragments of other systems. To bring matters to this pass, principles have been at work, which, though not definitely bearing on moral and religious questions, have had a grand influence in bringing the minds of men to their actual state of discontent and expectation. The practical republicanism of commerce, the collision, the increased activity of men's mode of life, has broken down the barriers between all classes, bringing every manner of men into contact with each other, so that they have gradually learned to regard all things in a more general light. Dogmas which have long been preserved cut and dried in the hortus siccus of sermons and moral essays, have no longer any effect, however ingeniously applied. Right and wrong have not changed their nature, but they are found to be more relative than positive, and are not to be dealt with by the sharp sweeping denunciations and vague assertions hitherto lavished upon them. Men have begun to perceive that there is a truth, a side on which it asserts its claim to humanity, in what is wrong as well as in that which calls itself right. Points that were once of vital interest and objects of the most bigoted partisanship have become matters of indifference, and though the attainment of unity and the universal brotherhood of humanity is still the philosopher's stone of morality, yet the centre of indifference, the common ground on which all men meet, is widening every day. Men are daily more ready to sacrifice their little pet parterres of private speculation and allow them to merge into the general life of the whole. Men do not as yet, perhaps, quite love their neighbours as themselves, but neither do they quite hate them so much for not being after their own likeness. Controversy on isolated points of doctrine does not flourish. Men have too much at stake in these days to have the heart to play its logic or quibble in syllogisms. They have no guide, overseer, nor ruler. The old faith in which their fathers dwelt has vanished from them. They may no longer lead their lives by it. They are encamped in the wilderness, gone forth not knowing whither they went, and their numbers are daily increasing. All recognised sects are gradually losing their hold. Grown old and ready to vanish away is the device inscribed on each. Unto none of them is it given to have the large utterance of the early gods. 
There is no room in them for the mighty heart of humanity to take refuge. This place is too straight for us, said the sons of the prophets in the days of Elisha. We are the children of the prophets, and it is the cry of men now. Only a very little while since, Mr. Newman and his company entered the Catholic Church. He has examined long and well. He has looked to the right hand and to the left, and finally has made his venture of faith. It is the grown man trying to return to the past and take shelter there instead of pressing onwards. He has endeavoured to become as a little child. If so be, he may thereby attain the kingdom of heaven, but childhood is a blessing only once in a lifetime. How can a man enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? The unknowing, loving, all-believing heart of a little child can never return again. A hundred and thirty Jews were baptised into Christianism the other day. They came out of their old faith, hoping to find a larger room amongst us. All men are waiting and expecting they know not what. They are waiting as those that watch for the day. Eighteen hundred years ago, the world was waiting as we are waiting now. The old forms, the old beliefs had lost their power. Men were without God in the world, and the sense of their desolateness pressed heavily upon them. One came and said, Follow me. It is written of him that he knew their hearts, and for more than a thousand years men have felt him to be their guide. If in these days one would arise who could gather together in one the hearts and aspirations of all men, who should be able to speak peace to him that is far off and to him that is near, who can know our hearts and make articulate all that is now struggling in human souls, who is there who would not arise and follow him? End of today. End of part one. Part 2 of Geraldine Dewsbury in Gerald Schilling Magazine, 1846-1847. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Things of Importance Published in Gerald Schilling Magazine, Volume 3, Number 16. This is a comprehensive category, and the items are as various as the contents of an old clothes shop. Everybody in the world has his things of importance, but he finds it hard to persuade his neighbours that they are not trifles about which no wise man would ever trouble himself. And yet, from the everlasting bustle that goes on, one might fancy that nothing was ever transacted on the surface of the earth but things of importance. Geographers tell us that the heights of the highest mountains in the world are, in proportion to their size, not more than the inequalities on the rind of an orange, and the affairs of life keep the mountains in countenance. The important things that fill the whole field of vision today, with their imposing bulk, dwindle down from the colossal to the merely mortal, when today becomes yesterday, and, on the morrow, they become absolutely invisible to the strictest investigations of history or scandal. In the experience of every man, the important things of today are degraded into the trifles of tomorrow. Nearly every occurrence of life is more indebted to the momentum of falling from the passing moment than for any specific gravity of its own. If it did not make one smile, it might well make one laugh to look back on all the things of importance that have agitated us in their time. Where are they now? Their joy and sorrow have perished with them, they have vanished even from our memory, and are now no more to us than the scenes of a well-written novel or play. Indeed, we come to regard them with precisely the same sort of feeling. It is the same with our wishes. A man may possibly desire no more refined vengeance on his enemy than to grant him the wish that lay nearest his heart five years previously. So long as life remains, men will put forth fresh desires every day as trees put forth fresh leaves every spring. But the same destiny is laid on each, 
that the old in both cases must fall off and die. Men must mould to their feelings and desires in the course of nature, and very miserable and good for nothing they feel at such seasons. But vitality is very strong, and as long as life remains, men must go on wishing and hoping, and transacting their things of importance, till death comes to place them under other conditions of being, of which we know nothing. Perhaps whilst it is going on, the most important thing in the eyes of all concerned, man, woman or confidant, is a love affair, a real fit of desperation, be it understood, not the tepid sentiment of preference, such as well-brought-up young ladies are instructed is all they ought to indulge in, if they wish to continue respectable. Decidedly, there is nothing in life worthy to be compared to a strong passion that calls into activity every faculty of body and soul. It is like the bursting forth of a volcano, showing all the strength and fire that lay hidden below the surface. It is not a thing that can last long. The whole world must infallibly go to the juice if it did. It dies away, leaving at first the appearance of desolate barrenness. But after a while, there springs up a richness and fertility of soul that was not so before. By those very individuals, the passion of love comes to be regarded as a mere dream, or as a milliner once phrased a dress cap, a charming delusion with beautiful blue. They retain of their former fires only a comfortable warmth fit for domestic purposes. If it were possible to place in array all the men and women on whom a grande passion had been lavished, all the objects of an unfortunate attachment, the amazement of everybody would be extreme when they beheld the show of very ordinary mortals which would appear to their disenchanted view. In love, it is an emphatic truth that nothing is but all things seem. When the heat of passion has passed away, the objects, when beheld in the cool light of reflection, generally seem greater bores than the average run of the sons and daughters of Adam. Few who have been the objects of passionate love ever turn into sterling friends. The things we most eagerly grasp at are like the pebbles in a sparkling brook. So long as the sun shines on them, and they glitter with moisture, they look to be very precious things, but in a little while they become dry and dim. One finds them good for nothing but to make roads with all, to tread under our feet every day. History is nothing but a museum for the fossil remains of things that were of importance in their day and generation. But we can seldom realise the tranquil assurance it gives that the most important of important things will petrify into matters of fact, only interesting as they in their turn are types of similar griefs or interests that will touch those who come after us to the end of time. For no emotion of either joy or sorrow is a private property. There is no monopoly in nature. We are all one family, though to be sure we occasionally meet with those whom we do not feel any pride in claiming for relations. Hence it is that men are libelously said to hate their own likeness in a brother's face. But it is no such thing. It is not the likeness they object to, but the very little justice that is done to it. Who is there who does not, from his soul, protest against a caricature or even a photographic portrait? Nurses tell little children that beauty is but skin deep, and we may rest assured that the importance of the most important people in the world is of even greater tenuity. A very little goes a great way, and a square inch of the reality may be beaten out to an extent exceeding that of gold leaf. The people and things of the most Augustan ages are not gold, only gilded with importance. The staple material of which they are made up is the same in all times. People have such a mania for fancying themselves and their concerns, exceptions to the general rule, whereas every man is an average specimen brick of the individual amount of real importance invested in the sons of men. To be sure, the inheritance of each is infinitesimal, but what of that? Each man has the gift to see himself with microscopic eyes which magnify a thousandfold. 
This is a wise provision of nature, for nobody would have the heart to transact his own affairs if he only saw them as they appear to other people. No wonder, then, our affairs are mismanaged when we turn them over to somebody else to do for us. When we take our walk abroad and see all the labour that is done under the sun, what is the impression that it makes upon us? We wonder that people can be found to take interest in such things, and we criticise unmercifully the smallest discrepancy between the programme and the performance of our neighbours. When one reflects on the amount of labour and pains that have been expanded on what have eventually proved failures, it almost makes one tremble. A very tragical history might be written on unsuccessful men if the world could be made to feel any interest in those who fail. And yet it requires an amount of actual talent even to achieve a failure. How many people are there who trouble their heads about the list of patents that are regularly declared? Not one in a thousand. And yet, if we could realise the amount of patience and labour, and time and money, and hope and fear, and sickness of heart, that have had to be endured before a single item in that list could be produced, one would be apt to wonder that the madhouses are not as wide as Tophet. And yet, nine-tenths of all this costly labour has been in vain, and comes under the compendious category of inventions that did not answer. But still, these things are hidden from our eyes, for if there were no man to undertake, in hope, labour that appears profitless in the eyes of others, the world would soon come to a dead standstill. King Solomon was wearied for want of some business of his own to transact. He was a bystander in the game of life, for he had soon played himself out, and that accounts for the terrible sagacity with which he discerns the worthlessness of all that is done under the sun. Such a keen conviction of the intrinsic uselessness of all things is not healthy. It is a wisdom not intended for us. We look out of our window at the people passing along the streets, and sit idly in judgment on their personal appearance and general aspect, without in the least realising that they are, each and all, cherished and respectable totalities to their individual selves, that there is a personality in their very defects, infinitely touching to the owners thereof. If the law of self-preservation were not implanted in the heart of each, it is to be feared that very few of us would stand much chance of salvation if we got into danger. Every man feels as if he were the sole person in the universe. The rest of the inhabitants have only a real existence in his eyes, so far as they help or hinder him in his own path. And he has merely an historical belief in the personality of the men and women who do not come near him. Himself and his own sensations are the only points he realises. Take the most insignificant traveller who ever set foot on the deck of a steamer and set him down in the heart of all the rushes. Will he feel of less importance in his own eyes, amongst the hundreds of thousands of strange beings who are gabbling their uncouth dialects, and leading their lives as best they may, than he did when in his own parlour, his feet cased in their worsted work slippers, his coffee-pot steaming up its fragrance, his muffin overflowing with butter, and his well-trained wife downstairs to the moment to preside over the breakfast, and anxiously inquiring what he would like for dinner. No, never a bit of it. He is always the same man, and the impression people and things make upon him is the only idea he has of their intrinsic importance. If he wrote a book about what he has seen, he will appear therein as the centre, whilst the rest of the world passes like a panorama before him. A man's sentiment for himself never fails. One sometimes wonders that the world does not get out of patience with the folly and stupidity daily transacted upon it. And so no doubt it would, for the world is not altogether peopled by fools, but every man is patient and long-suffering towards his own share of folly. The virtue of mankind in that respect is certainly exemplary. 
everybody is, however, of importance for at least one period of their lives, and that is whilst they are babies. It makes one half sorry that people should grow up into hardened men and women. The man who was hanged the other day was once the finest baby that ever was born, and it would be possible to trace back his career step by step, and as the weight of every day that brought its own evil with it was cleared away, we should come at last to the human nature that lay beneath the human heart that called our own brother. The most insignificant people, people for whom their neighbours feel profound contempt, have a soothing belief in a special providence, retained expressly to attend to their peculiar egotisms. It is lucky this source of comfort cannot fail, for if it were given to a man to see how very little his best friend identifies himself with his interests, he would never have the heart to live out half his days. It would be an unadulterated truth too much above proof for mortal senses to bear. Nature is very good to all her children, for as half the hardships of the world are imaginary, she fences men round with an armour of hopes and illusions to keep them from being hurt, or at least to soften the pain. It behoves then every man to deal gently by the harmless vanities of his neighbour, seeing that he also is encompassed about with the same. There is nothing, so far as we can perceive, amongst the affairs of men, of sufficient importance to be of any intrinsic moment to the well-being of the universe, nothing that will materially influence its course. Let the world lay that to heart and grow modest. On the other hand, nothing can be considered a trifle that brings either joy or sorrow to the meanest individual. Therefore, it would be well if each one of us, instead of thinking great things of ourselves, would be more tolerance and kindly affection to each other. We are all more nearly equal than we may be inclined to think. If we were to do as the Apostle recommended 1800 years ago, the world would not be the least bit nearer the pit of destruction than it is now that the people in it are each heroes in their own esteem. Nay, it is possible that things might work more smoothly, and that there would occur fewer of those cataracts and breaks, which, as it is, sometimes threaten to throw the times out of joint. End of Things of Importance End of Part 2Part 3 of Geraldine Dewsbury in Gerald Schilling Magazine. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Social Barbarisms, Hiring a Servant. Published in Gerald Schilling Magazine, Volume 4, Number 23. The world is very wicked, and has been so this long while. Indeed, nobody can recollect the time when it was good, but the wickedness does not seem equally divided, for, by all that is said, it would seem as if servants had monopolised more than their share of original sin and acquired wickedness. To hear the talk that goes on about them amongst respectable masters and mistresses, they seem to be a race of wicked brownies, endowed with a special malignity against those whose household work they perform. Everybody who keeps a servant complains of their intense badness, with an emphasis proportioned to the number their ill fortune obliges them to employ. It is a topic that comes home to everyone's business and bosom. If two men meet together, the chances are they will mention the weather, but if two women begin to talk, servants are the topic on which all their sympathies are warmed. To hear their comparisons of plagues and their catalogues of evil deeds is like looking through some great social oxyhydrogen microscope and seeing the monsters which, unknown to us, have been besetting our parlour, kitchen and hall, with the additional comfort of knowing that they are not safely imprisoned in a drop of water which we can swallow and so make an end of, but are actually rampant and at liberty, most of us having one or more going tame about our house, and no visible mode of delivering ourselves. It really is an awful lookout, if only half that is said of them be true, 
and there is our own private experience to corroborate it in the sufferings we ourselves have endured at their hands. And it becomes directly a most indisputable fact that servants are a very bad set indeed, could not, as a body, be much worse on this side of the gallows. But then, as nothing is self-created, nor can continue in the world self-existent, there must be some cause whereby they come to this pass, and some tap-root whence they are nourished, which keeps them going on at such a bad rate. Dean Swift warned his friend not to expect all the virtues under the sun for twenty pounds a year. But since his time, it would seem as if the virtues had altogether declined, going out to service. It sounds very grand in a sermon to hold vice in subjection. Yet, when it takes the shape of a domestic servant, it is a very bad handful indeed. When a man is very ill, he feels as if no human speech could give utterance to his potentous sufferings. But when the doctor comes and puts all the complaints in a few technical phrases, the dignity of the disease is departed. The patient who fancied his sufferings a special infliction of providence finds them written in the chronicles of the wise men of Gotham and the remedy flourishing in the prosaic pages of the pharmacopoeia. When an evil can be reduced to words, it is wonderful how manageable it looks. We do not profess to be very wise, but nevertheless, that does not prevent our feeling tempted to say a few words on the present condition of servants' question. It does seem a solecism in the working of our Christianity, a barbarism in the heart of our civilization, that two classes of human beings, masters and servants, subsisting in such intimate relation, so mutually dependent on each other, having such daily and hourly intercourse, should be entirely destitute of mutual regard, should be, in fact, in a state of mutual enmity, the masters putting no trust in the servants, and the servants looking on the master or mistress as their natural enemies, ready to take every advantage of them. All this apparent incorporation into one family is a mere matter of temporary convenience, and symbolical of no sort of friendly union. It is altogether a monstrous and unnatural state of things. No wonder it works so ill, and produces such bitter complainings on both sides. For, to use a servant's own phrase, there is no love lost between them. It is the total absence of everything like the love that ought to bind one human being to another, which lies at the root of the evil. No amount of wages or of mutual convenience principle will supply the place of that fellow feeling, which alone can make any sort of social contract or relationship between two parties work well. Certain virtues may be found very convenient in persons who have mutual dealings with each other, but the instant they are considered as nothing more than convenient qualities and made marketable, they lose their worth and become mere mechanical facilities for transacting business. They lose their vitality and become mere petrifications of what was once heavenly in its growth, a desecration of the most precious things, which works its own avenging. In the present relation between master and servants, the master has this great advantage, that his staff of virtues are entertained entirely for his personal good, the saving of his own soul, and the beautifying of his own reputation. With servants it is not so. Their virtues and good qualities are regarded only as so many conveniences and advantages to the party who engages them. They are examined, inquired into, and tested, as if they were so many points on which human cattle must be warranted sound to be fit for domestic service. A servant is hired in exactly the same spirit as a horse or a dog is bought. No sort of responsibility is felt at receiving a fellow creature under our charge. No sort of accountability is recognised for the way in which servants are to be directed and governed whilst under our control. We do not go to a bazaar and buy slaves as they do in the East, but we trade in all the higher moral and spiritual qualities, hiring them for ten or twenty pounds a year, and considering them merely 
has so many convenient qualifications in a set of beings into whose power we and our possessions are in some degree placed. We require a servant to be honest, because without that, our most earnest watchfulness cannot defend ourselves and our tea caddies from depredations. They must be sober, because otherwise our wine cellars will not be sacred, and a drunken servant, besides other practical disabilities, may chance to set the house on fire, and so on through the whole catalogue. We look at all their qualities as they affect us, and our own interests in their practical working. But as far as concerns the servants themselves, the human beings from whose soul these qualities are emanating, we take as little account of them, and feel as little interest about their individual history, their hopes, schemes and prospects in life, and know as little of them as we do about the dogs and cats which walk in and out of our rooms, or the poultry in the courtyard, when we discharge a servant, we ask no more questions of what becomes of him than when we sell a horse to someone who can pay for it. Servants live in closer intimacy with those whom they dwell than the nearest relations. They dwell under the same roof for months and years. They see closely and know the character of each individual as neither lover nor friend can pretend to do. Yet with all this, there is no fellowship no identification of interests. The connection is liable to be dissolved any instant. They receive their wages and go forth, none knows whither, and most likely servants and masters never behold each other's face again, for it is held a principle of good housekeeping not to allow old servants to come about the place. What can be more frightful than this state of things when we think of it? Everybody would lay claim to common humanity, as it is called. And yet, domestic servants have, we fear, a terribly short allowance meted to them. We are not speaking of any individual acts of cruelty tangible enough for the law to provide for, in a way, more or less clumsy, but of the intense want of fellow feeling exhibited with regard to servants. Ladies who would be indignant at any imputation on their humanity make no scruple of declaring that, so long as a servant does her work, they never interfere with her, and that, for their part, they seldom speak to a servant. Others declare, they never allow laughing or loud talking in the kitchen. The dress of servants is under strict surveillance. A lady of our acquaintance once parted with an excellent servant, because she refused to part with a band of black velvet, which she had a fancy for wearing round her neck. Few mistresses allow followers to their servants, although flirtation and lovers may be their own staple amusements. When spoken hardly to, with or without reason, servants are apt to be dismissed at a moment's warning. If their frail nature takes fire and prompts them to answer again, for the most angelic mistress will declare, she can stand anything but insolence in a servant. They are taken into a family to do their work, like so many animated dusters and brooms or kitchen rangers. No kindness or interest is expected from them, and indeed, any manifestation of feeling on their part is regarded with suspicion. They are not treated with as possessing any human feelings, and the indignant remonstrance of servants in seasons of great provocation that they have feelings like others is not uncalled for. Some mistresses dislike good-looking servants. Others think it sets off their house to have handsome ones, but it is quite a quality to be liked or disliked, never considered a human personality. The horror servants have of falling ill is painful to see, for if the disorder be fever or anything contagious, they are sent to the hospital or fever ward, if they have an accident that incapacitates them from work, they are discharged, if possible, before actually laid up, to keep clear of the charge of positive inhumanity. And what becomes of sick servants? Nothing can be conceived more homeless, helpless and forlorn than their condition, far worse than that of ordinary poor people, for they have, generally speaking, 
been well fed and kept in a state of bodily comfort and accommodation, till they are, like canary birds, unable to help themselves, and feeling doubly the hardships to which they are exposed when turned adrift. Servants have seldom any home to go to when out of places, and what bonds of relationship they may have are generally of the slightest kind. Their lodging houses are, generally speaking, nothing better than houses of ill fame. No classes of person hang so loosely on society as domestic servants. They have no one to care for them. They are become strangers to the houses where they once dwelt for months, or, it may be, years. They belong to nothing and nobody. Therefore, is it any wonder they should become hardened, neutralised, and thoroughly demoralised, by the habit of changing from place to place, till all idea of a permanent home is lost, come to seem an impossibility. Consider, moreover, the frightful hardships to which they are exposed, if, on leaving one place, they are not provided with another. For, as we have said, they have no homes, and their lodgings are not better than brothels. If we think of the close contact in which this class of people come with ourselves, with our children, for try as we may, it is impossible to prevent all communication. We may well shudder at the frightful evil lying within our very doors, and to which the supine indifference and selfish indolence of those who stand towards them in responsible position of masters and mistresses has conduced, and not any remarkable depravity in the unhappy beings themselves. The present generation of servants is thoroughly demoralised, and the evil will go on increasing, unless some change in the relation between master and servant takes place. The improvement must begin from above. It is the masters and mistresses who must reform their whole system of treating their domestics, before any improvement can be looked for in the servants themselves. They are the victims to a vicious and selfish system. The present mode of treating them is unchristian in the highest degree. The relation between master and servant is not a bond of mutual convenience, but a sacred responsibility, and no man or woman has a right to take human beings into their service, and throw them off without taking some sort of care what becomes of them, without seeing them safe in some sort of haven. We have confined our remarks principally to the case of female servants, and have said nothing of the thousands of footmen thrown out of place at the end of every London season, permanently influenced in their health from late hours and exposure to all kinds of weather. The intense bodily exhaustion caused by standing so many hours each day, the combination of extreme fatigue and moral indolence, depraved alike in body and mind, they are drafted off to the hospitals, to live or die, no one caring for them. A man can always make his way, somehow or another. They are in all cases better off than women. Female servants are so dreadfully to be pitied. Their fate is fearful. As a body, they are as bad as they can be, hard, foolish and demoralised. But they have become so in consequence of the cold-blooded, false, even cruel kind of relationship that has arisen between them and their masters. It is their greatest misery that they are bad. There are certain points in the actual working of our present social system which are far worse than any which exist under any systems we stigmatise as barbarous and unchristian. We have no slaves. Our servants are free. But the actual freedom consists in having nobody bound to care for them no one moved to do so by interest, and no humanity to supply the place of it. In the East, a female slave who bears a child to her master becomes at once a free woman, and he is bound to provide for her. Amongst us, there is a feeling of reprobation against a man who should abuse his position to seduce his servant, but there is no help for it if he does. He is bound to no reparation, the woman must endure the consequences and get along as well as she can. In point of fact, whatever may be the value of female chastity, 
It is a virtue nobody thinks of insisting upon in a servant. It is well known that it rarely, almost never, exists. Therefore, no questions are ever asked about it. If a woman be discovered in a lapse whilst in service, she is, as a matter of course, discharged at once, with much virtuous indignation. But if she be a good servant in other respects, it is no practical disability to her, as it entails no inconvenience on her next mistress, who would have to wait a long time if she were rigidly to inquire into such matters. This is a frightful state of things to contemplate existing in the bosom of a Christian country, in the home of almost every individual of the educated and higher classes. It is an evil that comes close home to us all, and goes on generating and increasing day after day. The generality of servants as they now exist are not fit inmates for a decent family, and chublocks and patent detectors placed on our sideboards and cupboards speak very distinctly to that point. Common locks and keys, as a lady said to us the other day, are no longer any safeguard. Masters and mistresses have themselves to thank. They have behaved as though they were little gods, and the distance between themselves and their domestics infinite, as if there were no sort of relation between them but the work they wanted done. Human beings cannot live together on such terms. The consequence is, servants league together and make common cause against their masters to defraud them in every way and do nothing they are not obliged to do. Evils generate evil. There is no specific for remedying the mischief. No definite line of conduct can be laid down. The change required must begin in the spirits in which domestics are hired and treated. Those who begin the form will, we are aware, have much to endure. A forlorn hope must always be served either by heroes or martyrs, and they who attempt in their own example to reform the present system of treating servants must expect to be disappointed and imposed upon, and, very possibly, to see very little fruit of their labours. The evil has now been too long growing to yield the first efforts. Servants, as they now stand, are, as a body, enough to disgust the most philanthropic. They are so ignorant and prejudiced that they seem hardly to have any human feelings to work upon, and it will require a long course of good treatment before they will be able to understand it, or to believe that it does not conceal some snare. They possess, in general, no one quality that can be depended upon, hence the complaint of their ingratitude, and the bitter disappointments in those that have for a while seemed exceptions to the ordinary run of servants. Their moral sense is very torpid at the best, and the common inconsistencies and shortcomings of human nature seem exaggerated in them. Much patience and forbearance and charitable construction of words and deeds is needed with the best of them. And it must be recollected that servants have no laws of good breeding, no education to restrain the expression of what they feel tempted to do. Great allowance needs to be made on this score, if a feeling of conscientiousness can be developed, all practical workings of good qualities will follow. For what seem to be good qualities in them now are too often mere appearances induced by the restraint and necessity of their position. A Quaker lady, a most estimable woman, who was matron of a servant's home on a limited scale, instituted by a few friends to afford an asylum to respectable female servants out of place, told us she was obliged to give it up on account of the conduct of those who became inmates. They were all servants coming out of decent places who could have good characters and who hoped to get into good families again. Their licentious and disgusting conversation the brutal and stupid pleasure they seemed to take in the destruction of furniture, linen and so forth, for which they were not responsible, their impudent and disobliging manner, and above all the awful lies, we would hope, in which they indulged concerning the families they had left, 
made her tremble at the idea of their being received among decent people. And yet, on application, their characters would be found satisfactory, because the restraint of their position, and the distance at which their mistresses had held themselves, had prevented any insight into their true nature. All this frightful evil must be grappled with. We must not expect to get hold of the best in our attempts at reform. Nor must we be discouraged if some turn out devils incarnate on our hands. We must examine into them more closely, and of course, naturally, we will not be surprised to find latent evil, which might escape detection in the superficial bond which commonly exists between mistress and servant. Anyone received into our family, in the capacity of a household servant, ought to be treated as a fellow being, not as an inferior. The discipline may be as strict as it will, the work may be as severe as it will. It is not on such points we would interfere, but the party hired to fill that position ought to be received as a member of the family, as having for the time a unity of interest with it, as an object of care and regard to the head of the family who has hired her, bound by a tie of fellowship, not of mere work and wages. This may sound utopian, but there is no other secret whereby good and faithful servants are to be made. They are placed in a subordinate situation, and have a right to a paternal interest and governance at the hands of those they serve. They cannot be kept subordinate, and left to shift for themselves at the same time. If the masters and mistresses, from a cold-blooded indolence, a disgust to the manner and language of servants as they now exist, shrink from all communication with their domestics, wrap themselves up in indifference to all that concerns them, keeping aloof at an impassable distance, looking only to the regularity with which their household work is performed, they can expect nothing better than what they now meet with. Servants are not so trained that they may with safety be thrown on their own self-governance. It is not mere bodily consideration that they require. Kindness of a superior to an inferior, of a benefactor to a beggar, that is not the sort of thing that is required at all. It is horribly grating, and will not produce the desired result of an attached and faithful servant. The grand thing required in our social relation with our servants is, that they shall not feel themselves isolated, with no interest in the family, and no affection or human feeling expected from them, and none felt towards them, nothing required from them except their work. Nobody can conceive the desolate effect of such a position unless they have tried it. The better part of human nature cannot flourish under such circumstances, and does not. This state of things works its own avenging, as all evil does. Masters are the victims to the vices of their servants, when they chance to be bad, and the slaves to them when they possess a modicum of good qualities. When they do nothing outrageously bad, they are humoured, and their caprices studied to keep up a mercenary sort of good humour, lest, knowing their own value, they should take pet, and leave their offending masters to the mercy of the fraternity. Servants know quite well that there is no heart-kindness in all this, and value the indulgence at its true worth. One half the trouble expended in scheming and humiliating expedients for keeping a useful servant in good humour would, if done with a different spirit, suffice to attach them for life and death. If we were to treat with servants, not as beings far down at a telescopic distance in the social scale, but as fellow beings associated with us by the accidents of life, with their interests combined with ours, chublocks and patent detectors would become superfluities. The servants in England are, as a body, the very worst in the whole world, and why? Because they are treated as inferior until they are made inferior. The servants on the continent look at their master's family with a very different feeling to what they do in England. They feel bound up and identified with them. They feel members of the family. 
their manners are more pleasing, and their tone is altogether superior. They are, naturally, no better, but they are considered and spoken to as fellow creatures, not as menials and inferiors. No substitute can be found for fellow feeling. No patent German silver benevolence can supply the place of genuine human heart. It behoves each and all of us to put our hand to this needful work. We may meet with stupidity and ingratitude, and seem to labour in vain, but patience will work wonders, and if we persevere, we shall have less complaint of the depravity and worthlessness of servants. We must be tolerant of shortcomings, very like our own, and whether we see fruits of our labour or not, we must recollect that it is not an optional duty, which we may take up and lay down as we will, but one wide and deep as humanity itself, and entailed on all who are in a position to keep domestics, from the one made of all work, up to a ducal establishment. Mais, c'est qu'on veut que le pauvre soit son défaut. And it is not in nature that masters are to be allowed to monopolise les défauts with impunity. End of Social Barbarisms Hiring a Servant End of Part 3「Part 4 of Geraldine Dewsbury in Gerald Schilling Magazine, 1846-1847. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. « How Agnes Worrell was taught to be respectable, published in Gerald Schilling Magazine, Volume 5, Number 25. « People get ruined, as it is called, every day, and what becomes of them afterwards? » Life, real life, does not end in a clean-cut catastrophe, like a novel or a tragedy, which has the convenience of making a decent end of the complicated embarrassments which have crowded on the hero. The events of real life are neither framed nor glazed in tableau, nor yet compressed into three volumes and bound in boards to prevent their extension. But they go on, and no ending is seen to them. The coup de grace is seldom given, and the luckless wretches linger on, dragging along their maimed course as best they may, out of sight and out of mind of those whose sympathies have been amused by the first grand crash of their fate. Not a daily newspaper appears without a list of bankrupts, some fraudulent and lucky, in virtue of which the wife refurnishes the drawing-room, and the husband sets up a carriage and goes about with a keen sense of the comfort and morality of being out of debt. In other cases, rich merchants who have lived like princes become honestly ruined, vanishing from the eyes of men when they have passed the commissioner and had their certificate signed. But where is it that ruined people go to? Are they thrown off from the social body like unhealthy secretions, or are they absorbed into it? Or how is it that they continue to make their place good in the land of the living? These are questions that have often perplexed us, and we have never received an answer. But there are many still more painful circumstances seldom touched on in novels. Heroes and heroines never transact anything but regular business, and the rascals are dismissed into a life of contempt and obscurity. Yet we are free to confess we feel a painful curiosity about some of the scoundrels of real life, men who, after having raised themselves to high places of respectability, exceed the legitimate license of the way of business, hurried on by temptations and opportunities of evading some immediate and pressing difficulty, make themselves liable to laws with very ugly names, and, from persons highly thought of, riding about in unexceptionable carriages, giving good dinners themselves, and invited to eat others elsewhere, become the scandal and horror of all their acquaintances, tried in a criminal court, sometimes hanged, and not unfrequently transported, leaving their wives and families in a condition beyond expression deplorable. For the men themselves we entertain small sympathy. The weight of their ruin falls on their families, their sons and daughters entering on life 
with the millstone of an evil reputation round their neck, and for them and their after-fate we have always felt a painful interest. The sins of the fathers visited on the children is one of the tragical unities always rigorously observed by fate in the drama of real life. The following history is quite true, and though the introductory circumstances are disguises, yet even they are not invented. Philip Worrell was for many years a highly esteemed merchant in a large manufacturing town. He was a man of great energy and enterprise, but he was in too much haste to be rich, the rock on which so many reputations have made shipwreck. He speculated largely in most of the schemes that were going, and was bold, sagacious, fortunate, and in consequence regarded as a most respectable man. He filled several corporate offices with great credit. He was one of the board of guardians and trustee to several charities, and many small tradesmen had confided their savings into his hands to be profitably invested. A commercial crisis arose before it was anticipated. Many houses fell. Strange rumours began to be whispered concerning the firm of Worrell and Company, from which, however, all the partners had either died off or retired and Philip Worrell remained the only representative. He was known to have entered largely into the American trade, and was supposed to be deeply involved in the failure of one or two large houses there, which had just been declared. In the midst of the various reports that were on foot, it transpired that Mr. Worrell had absconded. He had been seen in his carriage with his wife, driving in a direction out of town, and did not return nor make his appearance the next day, nor the day after, at his office. The greatest excitement prevailed through the town. Suspicious circumstances came to light, and finally a magistrate's warrant was issued, and Mr. Worrell was discovered, brought back, and was committed to the county jail to take his trial for forgery and embezzlement of the trust money of certain charities. After many delays the trial came on, he had a clever counsel, but the case was too clear. He was found guilty and sentenced to transportation for life. Everything he possessed was seized and sold, and the whole town was in a fever of excitement and indignation, for nearly everybody had lost money by him. His wife, to whom he had been always very indulgent, was nearly heartbroken, but with a faithfulness and credulity almost beautiful, refused to believe that her husband was anything but a victim to malice and hatred. She determined to leave the country with him. Her brother promised to adopt her only child, a girl of ten years old, and provide for her. The mother at first wished to take her along with them, but Philip Worrell could not endure the idea of his child seeing him degraded, and the poor woman, having to choose betwixt her husband and her child, clung to the former. The convict ship sailed, and Agnes, worse than an orphan, was taken by her uncle to his own home in a distant part of the country. It would have been better for Agnes never to have been born than to be left as she was to the harsh charity of relatives, indignant for the disgrace inflicted on their family by her father. But many people, if they were asked, would find they would rather never have come into the world at all. So, on the whole, it is as well there is no choice in the matter. Agnes bitterly lamented her separation from her father and mother. She was told they would soon return to her, but children do not understand being comforted by hope. She had been a spoiled child, and this was her first grief, and she was miserable till her grief were itself out. But even then she did not cease to be unhappy. Her aunt, without being absolutely ill-natured, was cold and egoistic, and anxious to make a very genteel appearance on limited means, and the addition of another inmate, to be provided for entirely, was a great nuisance. And then the circumstances under which she came were so disgraceful that Mrs. Maitland's store of amiability was sorely tried. The town where the Maitlands resided was a dull, decorous cathedral town, and zeal after scandal was too great to allow any successful mystery being made of Agnes and her relationship. 
The only way was to disguise it in the most becoming virtue available for the purpose. But that did not hinder the very shocking affair for poor Mrs. Maitland, being discussed at half a dozen tea parties, and all having come to the conclusion that she could do no less, and that it would be very awkward to see her under such peculiar circumstances. A general rush of morning callers was the result, each hoping to hear private particulars, which had not come out in the newspapers, and to learn what Mrs. Maitland intended to do with her niece, and what the child was like. Mrs. Maitland put a good face on the matter, and adorned herself with so many Christian virtues, and showed so much becoming sensibility, no saint in the calendar could have held up his or her head beside her. A good lady of our acquaintance once said that the chief happiness of going to heaven was that we should all feel such justifiable self-complacency, and Mrs. Maitland was certainly on the high road to that sort of beatitude, and grew quite resigned to her brother-in-law's transportation. Agnes was put in the schoolroom, along with her two cousins, only it was decreed that they were to be young ladies, and Agnes was to be a governess when they grew up. They were taught plenty of French, music and dancing, and Mrs. Maitland heard them their catechism on Sundays, and six verses in the Bible, and the collects for the day. They were repeatedly told to be good, but in what that consisted was left rather in the vague, and so the girls grew up. Agnes found a great difference between being a petted only child and a companion to two imperious young ladies, with vivid ideas of their own superiority, and who tyrannised and domineered over her unmercifully. Mrs. Maitland did not intend to be unkind, nor to make distinctions between Agnes and her own daughters but in a thousand unintentional ways Agnes was made to feel that her cousins were of more importance than herself. In fact, that she was of none at all. Agnes was a very affectionate child, but giddy, idle, and with not the least taste in the world for making herself useful. She grew up exceedingly pretty, far too pretty, indeed, to be left to her own discretion. She had a profusion of rich brown hair, a dazzling complexion, and one of the prettiest and most seducingly smiling mouths in the world. Her large blue eyes looked quite conscious of their power to do mischief, and her figure was tall and well-formed. When Agnes was fifteen, her cousins were old enough to be introduced into company, so the governess was dismissed, and Agnes was placed as a half-boarder in a seminary for young ladies, where she would be broken in to the duties of tuition as her aunt phrased it. Agnes was too good-hearted to feel envious, but she did not the least in the world relish her lot. She had quite as much taste for gaiety as her cousins, and could not feel by any means thankful for being sent out as under-teacher, though her aunt told her she ought to think herself very fortunate. When she came home at the holidays, one of her cousins was going to be married, and good-naturedly insisted on having Agnes as a bridesmaid, that the poor thing might have a little enjoyment after being moped up in a schoolroom for half a year. Her aunt was in too good a humour to refuse her consent, and what, with the finery, the vanity, and the visiting that had to be transacted during a long summer vacation, Agnes was more indisposed than ever to go back to her drudgery. After a time she was considered competent to take a situation in a family, and one was found for her. But the salary was only twenty pounds a year, without her washing, and for this she was to be governess and bonne to a little girl of eight years old, and something like femme de chambre to the mamma. At least that was the practical translation she found attached to the words, making herself generally useful. She made tea in the parlour when there was company, but she was expected strictly to refrain from attracting any sort of attention from young men. Agnes had more need of a duenna herself than to act in that capacity, even to so small a damsel as her present charge. But she was pretty and good-tempered, and the child was fond of her, which covered many sins. But unluckily, the husband of her mistress showed herself too sensible of her beauty, not in any very reprehensible way, 
but it is the high privilege of human beings, who are the only rational creatures in the universe, to have their present poisoned or sweetened as it may be by the thought of the future. So the good lady in question, though she saw no harm now, did not know but what there might be some time. So she took to being cross and fanciful. The husband was, consequently, put on his perverseness, and Agnes was touched in her vanity, and out of these small beginnings there might have been the devil to pay in the end. But Mrs. Smith, one fine morning, gave Agnes warning, saying she was going to send Nessie to school. Agnes returned to her aunt's, and was some time out of a situation, and visited with her unmarried cousin, and entered into all the vanity and dissipation that fell to their means, and got effectually disgusted with her own position. She had been told by her aunt the history of her father, and also warned by her not to hold her head too high, as few persons would like to connect themselves with a disgraced family. This had rankled in her heart, and her young life was eaten up with a secret repining and restlessness. No strong principles had ever been inculcated, no high notions of what really was good or bad. She had been taught nothing to stand her instead, under the temptations and difficulties likely to beset her path. Wisdom, fortitude and high principle were required by her position, and she had not even heard whether there be such things. Her vanity froissé, and her pretensions mortified at every turn, conscious of her beauty, and not without a degree of talent, she had literally nothing but the sense of respectability to stand between her and harm. Her father's relations were all in an inferior station of life, for he had raised himself by his own industry. Her mother's relatives had never expressed much concern about her, glad to have the trouble taken off their hands. Unless people are plagued into it, they will never of their own accord do a thing they don't like, and as they had not been applied to, they had stood aloof till they should be asked. But in a few months after Agnes left her situation, an old aunt invited her to come on a visit. It is a miserable thing when people have to look to their agreeable qualities as their means of getting a living, when what should be spontaneous has to be considered as a stock in trade. We never read an advertisement for a situation as companion, in which the cheerfulness, amiability, and obliging disposition and conversational powers of the advertiser are enumerated, without a feeling of painful shame, that for a piece of silver and a morsel of bread, the moral qualities should be hired out, like a second-hand piano, or instructions in French and drawing, at so much an hour, to whoever will pay for them. It is the last degradation to lose the right to have one's good feelings grow naturally, and as the spirit moves them, and bestowed only on those who can excite them. Agnes went to her unknown aunt with strict injunctions to make herself agreeable, and to study her humours. The aunt was what is called a decidedly serious woman, and a good woman enough in her way. But she thought all worldly amusements wrong dancing, decidedly sinful, all singing, except serious songs or sacred music, objectionable, and as for going to the theatre, that was an abomination not to be named. Agnes was taken to evening lecture, to distribute tracts at the neighbouring cottages, to missionary meetings and Bible meetings and missionary breakfasts and sewing societies and she had to read all the religious intelligence of the day aloud to her aunt, and heavy books on small doctrinal points, till she was bored to death, and her aunt was much distressed at the very worldly state of her mind, and talked seriously to her every day, and without ceasing, pointed out the wickedness and vanity of frothy novels and midnight revelling, and painted worldly pleasures, so differently to anything Agnes had ever seen, that her eloquent warnings were sadly wasted. Agnes had no companions of her own age, and, in her position, she had no right to think of what she liked and disliked. Agnes had once or twice been to the theatre, and in the bottom of her heart there was one desire, 
and that was to be an actress. She had never breathed it, except once to her cousin, Harriet Maitland, who was excessively indignant at such an idea. Her aunt had got to hear of it, and lectured her warmly on the disrespectableness of such a course, and begged that she would not dream of adding to the disgrace of the family. Agnes was frighted, but not turned from her desire, and now shut up in a dull house, with no sort of amusement, the idea of the stage seemed like a vision of enchantment, and the desire to be an actress grew all the more intense, for being compressed at the bottom of her heart. She had had several admirers and fallen in love, as she fancied, with sundry young men who had come in her way, but no offer of marriage had fallen to her lot. She had a great store of romance and inflammable fancy, and was dying of ennui beside. She had read plenty of novels, and, altogether sick and disgusted with her position, she dreamed only of emancipating herself from control and brightening up her destiny a little. In short, the young lady was, without any sort of rational occupation, and in an effervescence of fancy, and a yearning for some sort of excitement, that made it the greatest possible blessing, that no means of getting into mischief fell in her way. But, as the devil would have it, she caught a cold after she had been about two months with her aunt, and the cold turned into an ulcerated sore throat, and the old sedate family doctor, having many patients on his hands just then, sent his partner, a very dashing young man, only just come to the town to see Miss Agnes. The acquaintance did not end with the recovery of the patient. Agnes took a great fancy for visiting outlying districts of her aunt's poor people, and took to carrying them tracts with great zeal. But she met her new acquaintance every day, and soon imagined herself desperately in love. To him she confided her aspirations after the stage, and he promised to do all he could to assist her. He was engaged to be married to another woman of large fortune, but he could not resist the amusement of a clandestine flirtation. It came to her aunt's ears that she was seen walking with Mr. Patterson in the fields and lanes, when she ought to have been elsewhere, and Agnes was sent home in disgrace. Mr. Patterson had too great a respect for his prospects in life to stand up as the young lady's champion. He exculpated himself to her aunt at the expense of poor Agnes's reputation for prudence. He complained bitterly that she had beset him and thrown herself in his way and that he had never met her by appointment. He was believed and Agnes disgraced. Her aunt and cousin were very bitter at her return and did not confine their virtuous indignation to themselves. Their theory of moral sentiments was too good to be wasted on a single auditor and poor Agnes found all the small town au fait of her folly, and prone to believe a great deal more than had ever happened. Agnes was made so miserable by constant worryings that she was just ready to do anything to get away out of it all. Unjustly suspected, and suffering all the practical punishment of guilt, her good name was tarnished before she had learned its value. In the midst of all this, she received a letter from Mr. Patterson, full of regrets for the untoward exposure but the main object was to give her the results of his communication with a country manager. A clandestine correspondence was thus added to her other sins. It was discovered by the postmistress, who, suspecting the matter, sent one of the letters to Mrs. Maitland, and then there was a general explosion. No pity, no mercy. Agnes was sent in deep disgrace away into the country to be boarded with two cross old ladies, distant relations to her father. Here she still remained, within the last three years. Her history is not closed, and what the sequel will be seems problematical enough. If any further passages of her life come down to our knowledge, we will report them. Meanwhile, she is deeply to be pitied, it is not her fault that she is vain and frivolous. She was brought up to believe that making the best appearance at the smallest cost 
was the one great problem in life she had to solve, and the grand axiom given to guide her was the simple phrase, Appearances must be kept up. Placed, through no fault of her own, in painful circumstances, a thoroughly false position, which required the utmost strength of soul to endure, together with the nicest discretion to work any sort of bearing, she never had one sentence addressed to her capable of stirring the heart of a rational creature. She was left with all her natural levity, and her not unnatural love of indulgence and gaiety, to fight with her complicated position as well as she could, all her defence against temptation being the sense of respectability, instilled from her cradle, and all the rule of life given to guide her being expediency. She had hardly a common chance to save her soul alive. She was not worse educated than the average number of women in the present day. They are all taught much the same lessons, and it depends on fortuitous circumstances whether they continue in the ranks of the virtuous women, or whether they fall to be one of those who paint a moral and adorn a tale, for no strong guiding principle is instilled into them, along with their history and geography. End of part four. Part five of Geraldine Dewsbury in Gerald Schilling Magazine, 1846 to 1847. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. How Agnes Worrell was taught to be respectable continued. Some account of the life Agnes led with the two old ladies to whom she was sent to learn proper behaviour. Published in Gerald Schilling Magazine, Volume 5, Number 27. When Agnes went upstairs to bed, the first night of her arrival at the house of the two cross old ladies aforesaid, a sense of dreariness and sickness of heart came over her, such as she had never known. For the first time she realised that she had been sent away from the only relative she had, and that they had cast her off, and there was no one else in the whole world who cared for her, or took any thoughts for her. That as she sat there in that chill, prim little room, with its white sloping ceiling and narrow strip of threadbare carpet round the bed, miserable as she was, there was no prospect of anything brighter or better, that she belonged to nobody and had been sent like a piece of lumber up into a garret, to be out of everybody's way. Till now she had never paid much attention to all she had been daily told of her father's disgrace, but this night it came upon her heart, and crushed out all hopefulness or self-respect that lurked there. She was miserable and desolate, and in disgrace herself, a sense of guiltiness, for she could hardly tell what was added to all the rest and she sat down upon her still corded box, and wept bitterly. She had known little but sharp hasty speeches. She had always been kept in a constant state of reproof, but henceforth she would not even have that. There was no one in the world to whom, even in thought, she might stretch out her arms or address herself. Her long bright hair had fallen down, and her tears streamed like shining beads down the tresses that lay over her bosom, but her candle began to burn low and quiver in the socket, and hastily starting up, she began to try at the cords that fastened her trunk. But before she had disengaged them, she was left in total darkness. By this time she was thoroughly chilled, and partially undressing herself, she found her way shivering to the hard bed with its scanty white hangings, that stood in one corner. It was long before she fell asleep. The two old ladies had finished their family worship, and were sitting in grim and astonished impatience before the shining teapot, which seemed to have caught an indescribable likeness to its owners. At length the door opened, and poor Agnes, with swelled eyes and pale face, entered. She was fully alive to the solecism she had committed against the domestic convenance, and began an apology, which was listened to as if it were quite needed. "'This time it does not much signify,' said the elder, "'but another morning. I hope you will not be absent from family prayers. 
It is such a bad example to the servants. After breakfast, Agnes went upstairs to unpack, and as she placed her company dresses in the prim chest of drawers lined with newspaper, she felt much as one might fancy an unfortunate soul which has fallen under the displeasure of a magician and been shut up in a stone jar. All her faults and faculties were closely bound round her, but they were of no use. She could not move in the numbing atmosphere of all-pervading dullness. The tears she had shed overnight had relieved the miserable state of depression. She only felt now very dull and hopeless. Still, she determined to try her best, to be a good girl, as nursemaids phrase it, and to like the old ladies if they would let her. She had a thoroughly affectionate nature, which was nearly starved out of her by the great dearth she had found of persons who would let her love them. She descended to the sitting-room, where the two ladies were engaged on a large piece of what they called plain sewing, and Agnes took a seat at the work-table, and like the curly locks of the nursery rhyme, began to sew up a seam. It was an extremely neat room, but without one particle of taste visible in the arrangement of the grave prim furniture which was of an ugly and very old fashion. A bookcase filled with books of uniform size and binding stood in a recess by the fireplace, but they were all books nobody would ever want to read. A long history of England, in many volumes, filled one shelf, and a cyclopaedia of every possible and impossible thing filled the shelf beneath. There seem some books which have been written solely with a view to their being impounded in a bookcase, that it may be said that no gentleman's library is complete without them. The genius of dullness seemed the presiding larries of this asylum for books hard to be read. There was a dictionary, and Fordyce's sermons to young men, also to young women, a number of small magazines, long defunct, bound according to their years but there was not a single book anyone would take up and say, Oh, I wanted to see this. There was no chance of finding anything unexpectedly. It was a bookcase without any hope. Everything stood stiff and declared its appointed place, visible at a glance through the glazed doors. A print of the Princess Charlotte and another of her husband hung against one of the walls. Some ornaments of old-fashioned Dresden china little cupids with blue scarves and pots of roses, were marshalled at equal distances on each side of a plain timepiece. The chairs stood in their lawful places against the wall, but none of them seemed to have been invented for being comfortable. A table, covered with a perfectly clean but rather faded checked red tablecloth, stood in the centre of the room with a blotting-book and inkstand upon it, but no books were lying about. A work-table was placed under the window, which looked into the still grass-grown street, and at this table the three ladies were seated at their work. Plain sewing is by no means a stimulating employment, and requires to be flavoured with either scandal or scolding. Poor Agnes, a pretty, giddy young thing, lying under a cloud, sent to them to be taught to conduct herself discreetly was too tempting a victim not to be subjected to all les pains fortes et d'or of all the lectures and systems of propriety and morality two old ladies of the very best starch could apply. But first we had better describe Agnes's new guardians. The elder lady was a composed, grave matron, with a pair of large round black eyes that looked as if they could never shut, but saw everything, and had the peculiar faculty of giving no sort of indication of what was passing within. She never seemed to be either vexed or pleased, but kept up a precise, steady, scrutinising manner, as if she were a secret emissary from Radamanthus, and was treasuring up verdicts at the bottom of her soul for his instruction when she returned. She passed for being a miracle of sense and strong understanding, on the strength of seeming entirely unimpressible, by anything she saw, heard, or understood. Those sort of people drive one to desperation. One may break one's heart in the effort to get some sort of demonstration out of them, 
but all in vain. There they sit, in stony and petrified superiority to all the vitality going on around them. This was Aunt Priscilla, a very composed and consolate widow, of many years standing. Indeed, who the Mr. Priscilla had been, whose courage had encountered such a concentrated essence of feminine virtue, was only dimly known. It had been too much for his constitution, for he had been dead so long that nobody confessed to having seen him. She was dressed with scrupulous exactness in black silk and a net cap trimmed with lilac ribbon. Aunt Gertrude, the younger, was a round-faced, rosy, and ton soipeux, jovial-looking dame, of about forty. She would have been good-natured-looking, had it not been for a suppressed, malicious look in the eyes, which had the habit of lighting up with glee at the first word of gossip or scandal. She had a cat-like way of coaxing unwary victims to lay themselves open to her sympathy, which, so soon as they departed, hardened into a pitiless probe to manifest the length and depth of their shortcomings. There was something almost cordial in the genuine zest with which she told a tale of scandal. Her scandalous revelations had an air of friendly confidence, which was almost touching, so long as you were not the victim of them. She was a first-rate housekeeper, and very fond of giving maternal advice to young, inexperienced married women who found themselves unable to fight with sulky housemaids and rebellious cooks. But woe and double woe to the hapless confiding one who came to pour out her grievances and entreat her counsel. Such reports were instantly afloat about her waste, extravagance, bad management and matrimonial quarrels, that even the art of keeping down the inflammation of the weekly bills was too dearly learned. Still, she was not a bad woman. She only had more energy than she knew what to do with, and had an absolute need of some sort of excitement. She had never been married, and was now quite resigned to her state of single blessedness, and found her solace in making and breaking matches for all her acquaintance. She was dressed in a large shawl pattern gown, with a cap that looked altogether impossible. Its component parts were so complicated. Agnes stitched away in a subdued frame of mind, without venturing to begin a conversation. "'Are you fond of needlework?' asked Aunt Priscilla, in her clear, inflexible voice. "'Sometimes, but not particularly,' answered Agnes. "'It is so dull sewing when one is by oneself.' "'Well,' rejoined Miss Priscilla, "'I must say, I think one of the worst features in the present day is the increasing distaste of young women for rational and useful employment. In you, Agnes, it is particularly unbecoming. What have you to expect all your life? If you marry and become the mistress of a family, which is what all young women look forward to, you will find yourself woefully deficient. A woman has only a domestic life to expect. Few are intended to be authoresses, and therefore, it is my opinion, that the excessive devotion to books and accomplishments which is cultivated in their education is a highly undesirable method of forming rational young women. It only makes them idle and irregular in their habits, and gives them no real strength of mind. Yes, said Miss Gertrude, I must say, I think you are right. You show your usual sense. Young girls marry and know no more of housekeeping than their cats. There's Mrs. Godwin, poor young thing. She came down the other day with tears in her eyes to ask my advice, how she was to manage with her cook, who will never let her go into the pantry, and who used only last week seven pounds and a half of fresh butter, and they only four in family altogether, and no company. And the wasting candles and butcher's meat is frightful. Only fancy her asking me, if I thought eight and twenty pounds of meat too much to go in a week. But then, as I told her, she should look after things herself, instead of sitting reading in the parlour. She told me she always knocked at the kitchen door before she goes in. Goodness gracious! Only to think of such poor things put at the head of a family. No wonder men get ruined. I should not be surprised, mark my words, if Mr. Godwin takes to drinking 
all through the extravagance of his wife. She told me how ill-tempered he was at the bill from Marklands for vegetables and poultry. Only fancy, she had gone and bought asparagus when it was six shillings a hundred, ordered enough for them in the kitchen as well, because she felt awkward at having nice things cooked for the parlour alone. Ah, said Aunt Priscilla, she thinks of nothing but dressing herself and trying to write poetry. What a flighty young woman that Miss Barker is, cried Aunt Gertrude looking through the blind. She is always walking out, and she actually came inside the stage, all the way from Barnet, along with a young officer who got in a few miles this side of town, and got out again, just before the coach came to the stopping place. He got in for no good, I'll be bound. There was something very mysterious about the whole thing. There, he asked about lodgings, but I'll get to the bottom of it. See, see, sister, cried Priscilla, Mr. and Mrs. Butler are coming to call. They're crossing the street. How infirm she walks. I should not wonder if they come to ask us to tea. A ring at the bell occurred at this moment, and an old lady and elderly gentleman were ushered in. They were received with open arms by the two aunts, for they were opposite neighbours, and a source of constant interest and excitement to each other. The arrival of Agnes the day before had been an event fraught with interest to them, and they had had a lively altercation as to whether Agnes wore a cloak or a scarf, and their visit this morning was entirely to see Agnes, and hear all they could learn respecting her. "'Well, and so you have got your pretty niece at last. I said to Simon this morning at breakfast, we will just pop over and ask her to come in with her aunts tonight.' "'It will be more friendly than just leaving her to be brought by them, "'as if she were a work-bag or a lap-dog.' "'Happy to make your acquaintance, young lady,' said the pompous old gentleman, "'bowing till the little brown bobwig which he wore "'nearly touched the buckles of his black small-clothes, "'which he persisted in wearing, "'because he believed he still preserved a leg "'which to put in trousers would be ingratitude to providence, "'and hiding his light under a bushel,' which he held the most deadly of all sins. He was nearly seventy, but spare and erect, and full of a deadly, lively vivacity, which was terribly oppressive. He prided himself on being still as active as a young man. This sort of well-preserved vitality is more wearisome, and far more painful to behold than the natural decay of humanity. It is like nothing natural, the graces of childhood petrified into a caricature. He was very irritable and impatient, and snapped his meek little wife at every turn. Agnes was duly introduced, and the usual questions asked and answered. At last, after a desultory chat, when the old lady, Mrs. Butler, had ascertained beyond a doubt that the gown of Agnes was made of French merino, and that the buttons down the front were steel and not glass, she felt her mind set at ease and rose to go. "'My dear, my dear,' cried the old man, "'you are so giddy. Have you recollected to invite Miss Agnes for this evening, when we shall have the honour of making a small refection to welcome her amongst us, and to introduce her to several of our worthy neighbours? Mrs. Butler shook hands with Agnes, and quietly told her she should be glad to see her, and then they departed. "'So?' "'We are to have supper to-night,' said Aunt Gertrude. "'I wonder what they will give us. "'No doubt they have received their annual barrel of oysters from London, "'and we are invited to help to eat them.' "'The two opposite families generally spent an evening a week "'at each other's house to play at whist, "'but supper afterwards was only to celebrate high and solemn occasions. "'Tea at six, dry biscuits and a glass of wine at nine o'clock, was the ordinary arrangement. This, with evening lectures on two other evenings, which they never missed, and a tea-drinking and gossip once a week at a sewing meeting, which was held alternately at the house of half a dozen members, who had formed themselves into a charity for doing the poor people of the town, formed the circle of the amusements and recreations that awaited Agnes. This evening, however, Agnes was not destined to eat the oysters, for just as she and her aunts were putting on their shawls and bonnets and clogs to cross the street, a red-haired girl, 
the little servant's maid of Mrs. Butler, was seen rushing to the door. A frantic ring was heard, and a gasping entreaty that Miss Gertrude would come over directly, as Mrs. was took in a fit, what they call a paralasa stroke. This stroke was the occasion of a great change to the butler establishment, and had much to do with the future lot of Agnes. Strange that the fate of a woman she had not seen till that morning should influence the fortunes of Agnes. But are we not all living in a kaleidoscope, and the least touch suffices to change the combinations? Aunt Gertrude lost no time in obeying the frantic summons of Mrs. Butler's little red-haired servant, but trotted across the road as quickly as a pair of fractured clogs would allow, followed more slowly by her sister, Priscilla, whom even this exciting event had not moved from her stoical superiority. The door had been left open for them, and they entered at once into the little stuffy, oddly shaped sitting room, full of family relics and family rubbish, such as a succeeding generation with remorseless irreverence banishes from the parlour to the second best bedroom, and thence again to the attics, and finally to its last home in the lumber room. The poor old lady was sitting in her accustomed armchair on one side of the fireplace with her face drawn frightfully awry, and seemingly quite insensible to all around her. Her husband, in a condition of helpless excitement, was alternately sitting down on his own armchair, on the opposite side, and jumping up again, utterly unable to understand what had occurred. As she entered, Aunt Gertrude heard him saying, in a querulous, half-pitiful, half-angry tone, "'Dear, dear, dear, this is very distressing!' I entreat you, Mrs. B., to tell me what you would wish to be done, but if you look in that ridiculous way and refuse to speak, how am I to know? I am sure I wish to do all I can for you. Shall I put some more coals on the fire? Your hands are quite starved. Dear, dear, I wish somebody would come. By way of doing something, he attempted to lift the copper coal scuttle, but in his agitation he dropped it, and all its contents fell with a distracting crash amongst the bright fire irons and over the hearth rug. This completely overcame him. He sat down once more and began to cry pitifully, without perceiving his two neighbours who were now standing over poor Mrs. Butler and trying to rouse her to speak to them. Luckily, at this moment, the surgeon was seen to pass by the window and was called in. Mr. Butler had been too distracted to think of anything so practical as sending for him. The old lady was removed upstairs, and proper remedies applied. Aunt Gertrude, who did not want for good nature in her way, volunteered to sit up with her, whilst Agnes was sent over to make herself useful. Their cares were not long needed. A second stroke followed during the night, and the poor old lady died the next day, about the hour she had been first seized. The arrangement of the funeral, which devolved entirely upon them, consoled the two good ladies for the loss of their old friend. It is quite astonishing the comfort there is in mourning. No woman ever felt altogether wretched when she was to legislate for a new dress. The two aunts found it a very pleasant excitement to talk of the sudden death of their poor friend and the dreadful loss it would be to them. However, the excitement grew to rather a painful height when Mr. Butler also drooped and died. Agnes had just begun to hope that her last crepe frill had been finished, and that no more reviving was needed for Aunt Priscilla's black lute-string gown or Aunt Gertrude's tabinet which were respectively to be worn to save the handsome mourning that Mr. Butler had presented to them, when news came over one morning that the master was very bad indeed. The doctor declared that nothing ailed the old gentleman. Still, the old gentleman died. He had found everything and everybody so new and strange after the death of his wife. He had felt like a lonely child among strangers. He missed her, whom for fifty years he had been accustomed to scold and worry, and feel gently superior to. He pined away, and in less than three weeks he had rejoined his meek, 
faithful old wife in the family grave. All this sickness and death, and funeral business, to say nothing of the awful amount of stitching and remodelling of ancient dresses that had fallen to her lot, was quite enough to damp the spirits of a lively young thing like Agnes. She, like the wisest amongst us, could only see what was before her eyes, and did not dream of the Pandora's box just opened for her by the death of old Mr. and Mrs. Butler. In the afternoon of the day of Mr. Butler's funeral, a travelling carriage with four post-horses, all covered with mud, as from a long journey through bad roads, drove rapidly up and stopped at the door of Mr. Butler's house. A tall, ungainly, clumsy-looking man alighted, and after a short, and, as it would seem, impatient colloquy with the charwoman who had been left in charge of the house, the stranger re-entered the carriage, which immediately drove off. Aunt Gertrude was in the very act of lamenting the unaccountable absence of Mr. Butler's nephew from the funeral, when the carriage appeared and suspended her tirade, while she cautiously looked over the blind to see what was going to happen. "'That will be Mr. Butler's nephew,' said she. "'What a low, mechanical-looking fellow he is! No wonder Mr. B., who was quite the gentleman, and of an old country family, would never have anything to do with him.' "'If he be married, his wife will come in for that set of garnets and pearls,' said Mrs. Priscilla, with a gentle yearning after a legacy. "'But, Agnes, child, what are you looking at? It is not becoming in young girls to be seen staring out of the window. For old women like your aunt and myself, it does not so much matter.' The stranger actually turned out to be the aforesaid nephew of Mr. Butler, but he also had a name of his own. He was called Emmanuel Wilkinson, and was more extensively known by that than by the more respectable, though obscure fact, that he had the worthy Mr. Butler deceased for an uncle. He was Mr. Butler's heir, and remained two days in town to arrange about the property. The three ladies were sitting as usual at work before the window, when a ring was heard, and shortly after, Mr. Emmanuel Wilkinson was announced. He had called to thank the aunts for their attention to his relatives, and also to beg their acceptance of a few trinkets belonging to his aunt. The pearl and garnet were not included. Agnes was sitting in her usual place when he entered. She had looked extremely pretty in her half-mourning dress, high to the throat and small cambric collar, whilst her shining golden hair fell in clustering curls over her work. She had always been accustomed to genteel, still-life society, and naturally thought Mr. Emmanuel Wilkinson, with his loud, peremptory voice and broad, coarse accent, a most vulgar, unbearable person, and wondered how her aunts would condescend to speak to him. He was, besides, very ugly. His short, black, stiff hair stood up from his forehead. His sallow face was deeply marked with the smallpox. His thick lips and large mouth showed his unsightly teeth whenever he spoke. He did not seem to know what to do with his large bony hands. His feet, which were still more clumsy, were displayed in more than all their legitimate space of ugliness by the strapless trousers which had worked themselves halfway up the boots. With all this, however, there was a look of shrewd good humour about his eyes, which Agnes did not perceive, but sat still, taking a disgust such as only young girls can take. It was unpleasant to her to remain in the room with him. Her handkerchief fell, and he picked it up with awkward gallantry. She could not bear to touch it, and left the room to look for another. She sat, of course, in perfect silence, and had her disdain entirely for her own benefit, as nobody thought her of sufficient consequence to make any interpretation of it. Mr. Emmanuel Wilkinson, on his side, sat getting desperately smitten. He thought her the prettiest and best-mannered young lady he had ever seen. He prolonged his visit to an unconscionable length, but, as he was telling the two ladies all his plans with respect to his uncle's property, how he should build a mill and make the fine water-power in the meadow of better use than grazing a parcel of cattle, 
but to which his uncle would never consent, and that he should most likely build himself a handsome house, as he liked the thought of residing on his own property, now that he was a landed proprietor. Mrs. Priscilla and Mrs. Gertrude listened reverently to these details, which would make them oracles to the whole town. At length, Mrs. Gertrude ventured to inquire what he had done with the house opposite. They felt more interest in what their next neighbours were likely to be than in all the new mills ever built. Oh, replied Mr. Wilkinson, nothing could have happened more fortunately. A very decent woman, one who has seen better days as applied to me, and will take the house as it stands, fixtures and all. She wants to take lodgers, so if you ladies can befriend her, I shall take it as a compliment, for of course, being my tenant, I wish her well. She comes a stranger to the town. She seems a very inoffensive, quiet lady, and I let her have the house at a bargain, for the things would have fetched nothing at a sale. He now rose to take his leave, shook hands with the old ladies, and promised to come and see them again. As he passed Agnes, he stood half confused and offered his hand, which he did not dare to refuse. But the instant he was gone, she rushed upstairs, washed it, and then deluged it with eau de cologne to dissipate the shuddering disgust she felt. She thought of Mr. Wilkinson with a species of fright she could not account for, for he was nothing to her, though, to be sure, her aunts discussed nothing else the rest of the day except Mr. Wilkinson and his plans. Weeks passed along, and the monotonous life Agnes led with her aunts received no break. It was not the absence of visits and gaiety which made its monotony, but the entire absence of all objects worth the interest of a rational soul, nothing to stimulate the intellect or to cultivate the affections. Their life was an arid waste. Everybody was occupied in little details of household management, dress, tittle-tattle, the narrow course of their personal interest engrossed them. News. No one read even a newspaper, except the county journal, and then no one, in Agnes's circle at least, dreamed of reading even the abridged and diluted accounts of public events. Nothing beyond the local intelligence, and the births and deaths and marriages. They were all highly respectable people, who would have been shocked to death at any immorality, and have excommunicated any expression of opinion, showing sympathy or tolerance for anyone convicted of the smallest sin against the due and solemn routine of thoughts, words and deeds, to which they were dedicated as horses to a mill. They had no internal vitality to stimulate the torpor of their souls, and therefore greedily sought, by observations and criticisms, after every word and action of their neighbours, to keep themselves amused. It was like drinking drams on small beer, very temperate and unstimulating beverage, amounting to almost teetotalism. But then they could not get anything better, so nothing but the principle was given in, and they could only understand what came out in actions. The men were little better as regarded the amount of vitality and rational worth of their existence. They were principally country gentlemen, on a genteel competence, and professional men, for there were no manufactures to contaminate the gentility of the neighbourhood, which was an agricultural district. They were all high Tories, and talked of their own topics amongst themselves. The women never joined, and there was an entirely different style and manner, when they for a few moments looked away from their own talk and addressed the ladies. There was a subterraneous feeling of contempt, or at least indifference, to the judgments and opinions of women. They were looked on as something altogether apart, and not admitted to equality of intercourse. This was never expressed in so many words, but it was a feeling that showed itself in a thousand ways. It was a refined and ameliorated version of the Indian wives, who may not sit at table with the men. They were very rigid in their notions of what is proper in women, as all coarse-minded men are, which also marks all states of imperfect mental cultivation. They suspected evil on the slightest appearance, and had an instinct for putting a coarse construction on the most needless actions. 
in fact the belief that all women would be bad if they might seemed branded into their souls too deeply to come out in words it only tinged every thought and feeling with regard to women who were held by them in a state of moral serfdom this it was that lay at the root of the dull soulless inanity of the women their apathy to all that was high and generous no wonder their human nature stagnated in such an atmosphere and was unable to animate their domestic life with higher and worthier sentiments women are always a generation behind men in their modes of thought and the men it is who must begin to have higher and nobler aspirations for women before women can break through the dull thick indifference under which so many noble and delicate faculties such high-minded devotedness and singleness of heart lie crushed down as it is they act and react on each other men are afraid of women becoming less agreeable less useful to them lest they should become less relative in their existence lead their own lives for their own soul's sake and not with an eye to the pleasure and taste of men alone they are afraid of them being too strong and therefore tolerate nothing but the reflex of their own minds and opinions reproduced and exaggerated they get nothing fresh in their intercourse with women it is breathing over and over again the same mental atmosphere and humanity is kept below its legitimate level so long as women receive all their light through the refracting medium of the opinions of their brothers and lovers and husbands they will never attain either wisdom or insight and they will seem to justify the contemptuous speech we once heard from a clever man which was that he never in his life heard a woman speak sense for five minutes out of her own head clever women are generally signal failures they do not receive what they are told with undigested meekness they have too much activity in their own mind for that and change and twist what instruction falls to their lot into very fantastic results the error that works the mistake does not lie on the surface and the faculty to educe wisdom and clearness lies still deeper and has never yet been worked out if the tone of female aspirations were raised if they were incited to be noble and fearless in heart they would be every bit as respectable as they are now or as dr gregory himself could desire for what is respectability but a leaden image of the pure and noble instincts which ought to have their dwelling place in the heart of man an attempt like that of heathen savages to represent by their misshapen idol that which must dwell like fire from heaven in the deep heart of man before it can sustain a human soul in the wearing perilous toil of life the stimulus of respectability fails in the passionate emergence of reality what a mockery is an appeal to the respectability of the thing made to one who is standing face to face with a great trial as if respectability could swallow up temptation no it needs a mightier deity than this to control and direct a life but we are putting the moral of our story in the middle instead of the end a terrible solecism in the established etiquette of such things a digression is always tempting to him who makes it it looks like a sort of small inspiration one follows it in the hope of finding something not promised in the programme but now to return to agnes at the end of six weeks after the house had been painted and papered and beautified throughout the new tenant arrived and took possession she was a quiet meek little woman who evidently had as mr wilkinson surmised seen better days and much trouble and care also the two ladies made an early call upon her aunt gertrude made many bustling and patronising offers of goodwill and assistance mrs priscilla was mildly sententious and they both returned home declaring her a very respectable woman who knew her position and whom they were determined to notice then came the wonder and the question asked of each other a dozen times a day who would be the lodger time solves every perplexity if he be only left alone and in less than a month 
Two lodgers were installed in the house opposite. One was a little, thin, wiry old maid who had come to the town to give lessons in painting on velvet and making wax flowers. She had the front parlour and the second floor bedroom. In the drawing room was a young man of about eight and twenty or thirty. What he came for nobody could exactly tell. He made excursions into the neighbourhood and was away two or three days together. He painted watercolour landscapes, drew plans, read books and received a great many letters. He was very good looking and very gentlemanly in his address. The two aunts made his acquaintance on the same day that they went over to view the display of wax flowers and painted velvet in the front parlour, and so well were they pleased that the whole party were invited over to tea that very afternoon, in something more like an impulse of enthusiasm than had deranged the steady current of their lives for years. The aunts were also taken with a desire to be the first who had a bouquet of wax flowers under a glass shade in the window recess of their drawing room, and also to have a pair of ottomans and a screen of painted velvet. To accomplish such dazzling results, it was decreed that Agnes should go over and take lessons in these occult arts. Agnes was thankful for anything that took her away from the everlasting sewing that went on every day from nine o'clock till three, and attended her lessons with great zeal. The drawing-room lodger often came down to have a chat. He lent her books and showed his drawings, and told her she might have any she liked to copy. There was a great force of romance smouldering down in the heart of Agnes. The least grain of sentiment thrown in would have brought a hundredfold in return. But the drawing-room lodger did not throw in the grain, and the heart of poor Agnes was destined to lie fallow. Amongst other works, she brought from his bookcase a volume of plays which she was obliged to read by stealth, as her aunts would not have tolerated such perilous reading. This revived all her old longing for the stage. She got up in the middle of the night to act scenes from Pizarro and the castle of St. Aldebrand. She built castles in the air, of which she was the heroine, dreamed of the world and all the shining gaieties of balls, theatres, carriages and elegant dresses. In the midst of all this, Mr. Emmanuel Wilkinson came to lay the foundation of his mill. He was now constantly backwards and forwards, and spent every evening with the two old ladies. Agnes, by dint of dreaming constantly of her castles and her novels, continued to abstract herself pretty much from all that was going on, but her detestation of Mr. Emmanuel had not in the least subsided, and, it must be confessed, nothing could be more unlike the heroes and angels of her imagination. She had not the least idea of the impression she had made on the tough heart of that worthy man. Her astonishment was extreme when, one morning, as she was preparing to go to her wax-flower lesson, Mrs. Priscilla, with a prim smile of satisfaction playing round her mouth, in spite of herself, desired her to remain at home as she had something to communicate to her. Agnes sat down in placid wonder. It had been so long since she had heard anything pleasant or amusing that it never struck her to hope. Mrs. Priscilla began in a clever, calm tone, though I do not think it desirable that young women should have their minds filled with idle notions of suitors and marriage. Yet, when a girl is modest, well-mannered and pleasing in her appearance, it is not surprising if she attract the notice of the other sex. It is a thing she may reasonably look for, and it is the highest and most gratifying tribute a virtuous woman can receive, and she is doubly fortunate when her admirer is a man of sense and character one able to confer upon her a respectable position in the eyes of the world. For a girl in your unfortunate family circumstances, the protection of a sensible, worthy man is more than usually desirable, and therefore it is with great satisfaction I inform you that Mr. Emmanuel Wilkinson desires to make you an offer of his hand, and he has most honourably and properly communicated in the first instance with my sister and we both join in our best approbation, and consider it a singularly fortunate event for you. Of course, 
you have no frivolous young lady objections to offer, and therefore we shall give Mr. Wilkinson an opportunity of pleading his own suit to-morrow afternoon. I make no doubt you will receive him as a delicate-minded female ought to do. You will not seem too much elated by the compliment. A woman must always keep up her dignity in the eyes of the other sex, and not allow them to perceive the interest they may have secured within her bosom. Modest, retiring, and cold ought to be the bearing of a young woman listening to her suitor. Agnes, child, what is the matter? said Mrs. Gertrude. Are you ill? No, said Agnes faintly. But Mr. Wilkinson is so very ugly. A modest and truly delicate-minded woman never allows herself an expression on the beauty of her lover, replied Mrs. Priscilla sententiously. And beauty is a very frivolous thing beside the sterling and respectable qualities of Mr. Wilkinson. But, said Agnes desperately, he is very disagreeable and after I have married him I shall be sure to see somebody I could have liked better, and then I could never be happy with him. My dear Agnes, let me never have such a shocking speech again. What would any gentleman think who had heard you? When a woman is married, it is her duty to love her husband more than any one else in the world, and no English maiden would even dream of doing otherwise. She must be of an unhappy and depraved turn of mind, if such an idea as that entered her head for one moment. She would no more think of getting tired of her husband than of her own father or brother. Yes, but, said Agnes, one is supposed to take a husband from choice, and your relations you cannot help yourself about. And then, concluded she, in a slightly heroic tone, I do not love Mr. Wilkinson, and never can. I don't like to hear your head running on love, said Aunt Gertrude. None but weak, silly girls talk about it, and above all, never let a gentleman hear you. Men do not like it. It looks forward and impudent. Yes, chimed in Mrs. Priscilla, and let me tell you, although you may not believe me now, that however hot love may be at first, it all goes off fast enough, and at the end of six months, you will only know from recollection whether you married for love or not. Therefore, it is absolutely essential that your choice be made with prudence, and you allow yourself to be guided by those older and wiser than yourself. But why need I be married at all? said Agnes. What else has a woman to look forward to, I should like to know, said Miss Priscilla sharply. A poor helpless forlorn creature she is when left to herself like a stray cat on a high-road, unless she have some prudent, sensible man to take care of her. Very few women have your Aunt Gertrude's strength of mind to make them respectable by themselves. "'You ought to be grateful that such an opening is made for you,' said Aunt Gertrude. "'For very few respectable men would like to marry a girl whose father was transported. I don't mean to reproach you with your misfortune.' but to point out to you how desirable it is that you should not throw away such an eligible opportunity for making yourself respectable and independent. But no delicate-minded woman would wish to be dependent and a burden to her friends, and your unfortunate position will be a hindrance to you, ever making your own way. However, you will think the matter over and come to your senses by tomorrow, which will be time enough to return an answer. Poor Agnes was no longer in a condition to listen to such sensible harangues. She was sobbing violently. She only heard her aunt's permission to withdraw, and left the room, and the kind-hearted housemaid found her a few minutes afterwards in strong hysterics. "'Dear heart, Miss Agnes, don't take on. You'll be doing yourself a mischief,' said the housemaid, when she had administered such restoratives as first suggested themselves. "'And what is to become of me?' cried Agnes, wringing her hands. "'I wish I were dead. I wish I had never been born. "'Oh, why did my mother ever leave me behind her? "'How cruel she was to leave me with nobody to care for me, she little knows.' "'Dear Miss Agnes, don't talk in that way, but just tell me what is the matter.' And she put her stout arms round Agnes, and seemed ready to cry for company, 
only that the prospect of a secret consoled her. Agnes told her all that had passed. "'Well, to be sure, the old cats, that I should call them so, to think of going to marry such a pretty young lady as you to such an old fright. I would have nothing to say to him if I were you, miss. Just stand it out. They can't marry you against your consent, so just defy them. I would go out to service if I were you, before I would be made miserable for life, though I was to ride in my coach for it. But they will turn me out of doors, said Agnes pitifully. Never mind, let them if they dare, or the town would cry shame, and if they marry you, they won't bear it for you. Take my advice and just stand it out, and if they're stiff, show that you can be stout. The step of Miss Priscilla was heard on the stairs, and her ally made a hasty retreat, leaving Agnes to encounter the fresh vials of her aunt's wisdom. At the sight of her, Agnes became so much agitated and excited that Mrs. Priscilla was obliged to suspend her remonstrance and ring the bell for the housemaid to undress her and lay her in bed. A few drops of laudanum were administered to compose her, and she was left to herself. The next day, Agnes found herself in deep disgrace, and for days and weeks, every species of tyranny and punishment were employed to conquer her ridiculous obstinacy, as they called it. Her aunt, Mrs. Maitland, wrote letters full of the most drying wisdom, extolling Mr. Emmanuel Wilkinson to the skies, and entreating her sweet niece to recollect the disgrace of her father, and not to lose such an opportunity of settling herself and restoring the credit of the family. Letters came from her cousins, eloquent on the advantages of making a good match, and assuring her that she was the most lucky girl in the world. But not a creature spoke to her of the duties and responsibilities that would be entailed on her. The respect for those was supposed to follow naturally and of itself in the wake of such a respectable connection, and to be the legitimate consequence of her respectable family education. Nothing was dwelt upon except that she would have a home of her own, that her husband would be rich and would have everything she could wish for, and that she could have no reasonable objection to Mr. Wilkinson, a worthy, respectable, sensible man, who was doing her an honour by being attached to her. Agnes resisted obstinately for a while, but the daily worry of the continual dropping of sentences of worldly prudence, the absence of anyone to sympathise with her, the dull vista of years of a whole life spent with relatives who wanted to get rid of her, the petty tormenting which was unmercifully exercised towards her, all conspired to break her spirit and make her desirous to get anywhere to be away. She was once or twice on the point of yielding, when a visit from Mr. Wilkinson, whom her aunts insisted upon her treating with civility, brought back her intolerable loathing and reinforced her resolution. One morning, her aunt Gertrude, who was reading the newspaper, found an advertisement for a teacher in a Yorkshire school. She seemed struck with a bright idea. Laying down the paper, she said, turning to Agnes, in a persecuting tone, and with an accent of suppressed displeasure, although conscious that it was perfectly allowable, "'Now, Agnes, my sister and myself cannot put up with all this any longer. Our lives are made miserable by your sullenness and obstinacy. If you persist in being blind to your own advantage, which is all we have in view, you must take your own way. You cannot blame us. This is the last time we shall speak of it. Some consideration is due to Mr. Wilkinson. Take till tomorrow to consider what you will do. If you refuse him, then we must take some steps towards getting you a respectable situation in a school. Here is an advertisement for a teacher, and in that case you shall apply for it. Now you may retire to your own room. Agnes slowly and sadly withdrew. In about an hour, her aunt Gertrude came quickly into her, with a small packet in her hand. See, Agnes, said she, in a more good-natured tone than she had used for weeks. "'Surely you are ruining the best prospects a girl in your position ever had. 
and all for the sake of a whim. Look here, what Mr. Wilkinson desires our permission to present to you. His aunt's set of pearls and garnets, all newly set, and looking fit for a countess. And this letter, too, so kind and proper. Mr. Wilkinson had, for once, shown his tact. He has stayed away himself, and written a kind letter, hoping she would soon put an end to his suspense. It did the business. The next morning, Agnes wrote under the inspection of her aunts a distinct acceptance of his proposals. Everybody now seemed to vie who should make the most of Agnes and show her the most attention. She was going to be married and to have a house and carriage of her own. Her aunt Maitland wrote that she must be married from their house, as they lived in better style than Mrs. Priscilla and Aunt Gertrude, who were also invited to the wedding. Mr. Maitland presented her with a hundred pounds for her outfit. Everybody was delighted, and in the unwanted excitement of being made much of, and the pleasure of buying new dresses, Agnes grew half reconciled to the step she was taking, when Mr. Wilkinson was out of the way. The day came at last. There was no drawing back. Agnes was married, and Mr. and Mrs. Emmanuel Wilkinson drove off in a handsome chariot and four, with postilions in red jackets. They were to go to London and Paris, and Agnes was loaded with commissions for her cousins. Here we will take leave of our heroine, as she is now a married woman, in a highly respectable position. Some of our readers may think we have made a great fuss about nothing, and that Agnes was a very fortunate young woman to have found a steady, respectable, wealthy man to marry her. Is there then nothing real in life, except a worldly position and the material advantages of a grand house, splendid furniture, plenty of money? Are they of such overwhelming importance that they deserve a young girl should sell herself for money, body and soul, that she should for money consent to fill a position that entails duties and responsibilities which nothing but the most entire and perfect love can enable her to discharge? Do they deserve that a woman should swear to a lie to obtain them, and by one comprehensive act devote the remainder of her days to the infernal gods? Do they deserve that a woman should brand on her inmost soul the burning shame of simulating for money that holy passionate love which fuses two human hearts together and of two separate existences makes but one? Yet all this a woman does who marries without love, for the sake of obtaining a worldly position. She who does this thing may go to church in all the splendour of Brussels lace and orange flowers, may have a dozen bridesmaids and the sanction of bride cake and a special licence, but she still sells herself in the coarsest and most absolute sense of the term. She makes a better bargain than the poor wretch who stands in the street at night. The law guarantees its fulfilment, and society agrees to sanction it. But the deep, burning degradation of the reality is the same in both. What is the race that can be expected to arise from such marriages as these? How can the children be noble, high-minded, manlike, when the mother has crushed down all the deep, passionate instincts of her heart? and ended by disbelieving them. If in the case of Agnes we could look forwards, we should see the palsy of worldliness benumbing all the warm spontaneous impulses of her youth, her liveliness and giddiness giving place only to hardness and selfishness, her life's aim and object heaping together the glories of upholstery, giving dinner parties and keeping up her consequence in the neighbourhood, the leprosy of intense vulgarity, valuing only that which is seen, killing all the refinement and delicacy that is indigenous to youth. Then the intense ennui which follows, and like a vampire feeds on the very life, for as all has centred in self, and self alone has no sufficing vitality, a thickened life in death is all that is left, unless she succumbs to terrible stimulants. This is not an overcharged statement. If a woman sacrificed only herself, it would be most piteous. 
but a worldly marriage is emphatically one of those cases in which the sins of the parents are visited on the children. End of How Agnes Worrell Was Taught to be Respectable by Geraldine Dewsbury End of Part 5Part 6 of Geraldine Dewsbury in Gerald Schilling Magazine, 1846 to 1847. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Lower Orders, published in Gerald Schilling Magazine, Volume 5, Number 28. In old times, all religions and schools of philosophy had what was called the secret, viz certain doctrines not openly professed, and into which even students and disciples were not initiated, until, after a severe apprenticeship, they had proved themselves worthy to be instructed. After their admission to the knowledge of the secret, they were not allowed to give it utterance, but were bound to envelop their meaning in such language that the real sense and inspiration of it could only be intelligible to the initiated. It was deemed sacrilegious to endeavour to permeate the mass with the sacred knowledge. The mass in those days consisted of the confused, inorganised majority, the raw material of humanity, not recognisable as individuals, but which formed the staple of the world, as a ground for the more highly gifted to tread on, an unknown, muddy, not milky way, about which none took any concern. The infinite capability that lay crude and dormant in the mass was not dreamed of. The inert force had not been made manifest. It was the great quarry of undeveloped humanity, out of which, from time to time, the elect and chosen were detached and fashioned into living stones, but the length and depth of which was undreamed of. Ages have passed away. All kinds of chances and changes have befallen the world, one tendency has been visible through all. All events seem to have worked themselves to one end. The clash of many coloured and conflicting interests has wrought one pre-eminent result. The circle of the elect has steadily and gradually become wider, the partakers in the secret more numerous, till at length the dusky, confused, weltering mass of humanity, which so long had been uncared for, like mud at the bottom of a pool, is admitted to the brotherhood, and recognised to consist of men with reasonable souls and human flesh subsisting, men of like fashion with the learned and noble, the rulers of the world, who heretofore had alone the privilege of dwelling in the light, which the others might not approach unto. It is so much submerged land, recovered to the domains of humanity. It was thought by all the powers that were, an awful atheistic anarchic proceeding when, eighteen hundred years ago, the poor had the gospel preached to them. It was the first glimpse of their social recognition. Long ago, the freedom of religion was conceded to them, but all the gentility and prestige of philosophy was stripped from it. The learned and the wise still insisted on their secret. They took to education when they could find a moment's breathing time from their everlasting wars, and that was all sacred to them. Into that circle no vulgar were admitted. Religion was enough for the poor, the people had no need of instruction. When it was proposed to preach education to the mass, to make the canai eligible to philosophy, science, civilising influences of all sorts, it was scouted as a chimera hooted as a blasphemy, and pelted with ridicule, the only civilised phrase of persecution tolerated. Yet at length the principle stands detached and clear from the confusion. It has come to be recognised that the mass are worthy to hear all that can be taught, that instruction is their birthright, and not an arms to be bestowed by supercilious benevolence or speculative theorists. There is no longer a corner where secret or sacred things may abide. All is thrown open to the mass, the million, the people, who stand revealed in the rude, massive, undeveloped possibility of their brawny, sinewy, savage strength. Refinement and fastidiousness have no more a refuge 
except to curl themselves up like excruciated, sensitive plants. All that for so long has been enshrouded in the learned twilight of academic bowers is today brought naked and unreservedly within the bare walls and glaring gaslight of mechanics institutes. Everything may be taught, and everybody who will may hear and learn. Every sort of doctrine may be discussed by anybody and everybody. To the doctors and philosophers of old, this state of things would have been a shock and an outrage, such as we might imagine if a revolution were to take place in the region of the faithful, which should abolish the privilege of the harem and allow the inmates to walk forth unveiled to the distraction of men and angels. And yet these new barbarians are not receiving a license, nor a privilege, but a right, of which they are but just now receiving intelligence, a right which can never again fall into abeyance, unless the whole social system fall into dissolution. A fact that has once become declared an absolute never relapses into the chaotic uncombined elements from which it was called forth. Let the people, the newly developed order in humanity, rejoice in their strength, in their savage powers and unblase faculties. The recognition of their rights, their entrance on their own heritage so long withheld, makes a grand, a divine epoch in the world's life. But it is only when contemplated as a whole that it is grand. Regarded as a movement, penetrating with newness of life, a hitherto unrecognised section of the human family, going on from strength to strength until each individual shall stand before God, each perfected according to his measure. It is very grand, and every heart must kindle and burn at the contemplation. But when we descend from the mount of vision to the actual and practical working of the thing, and stumble amid the coarse material details, enthusiasm is well nigh stifled with disgust, and except to those gifted with the most keen and loving insight, the divine idea which at first seemed so glorious is effaced on nearer contemplation of the irreverent ignorance, the presumption, the intense vulgarity, the coarse and clumsy attempt to meddle with high things, the utter absence of all modest misgivings, the absolute want of perception for taste and refinement, which characterises these new barbarians. It is all very well for those engaged in forwarding the movement to dwell upon the great principle involved and to keep their eyes steadily fixed on the magnificent whole. Otherwise they would not be able to keep their hand to the work they have undertaken, but the people themselves are not to be encouraged in any such soothing, self-complacent process. They are neither grand nor glorious, but a huge, rude, untutored, ignorant mass, with no beauty to make them desirable or tolerable, except to the eye of infinite hope. The intense interest that is now excited in the condition of the lower orders is not aroused by them as individuals, but by the superb and all but utopian looking result which is hoped for, which is to qualify those who for ages have been considered as only a degree beyond the brutes to present themselves amongst the sons of God. The attraction does not lie in them, but in the endeavour to realise the truth that in the poor, hungry, slaving mass, with their intellect all torpid, and their senses lying callous and buried under the brutal, sordid environments which for ages have accumulated round them and over them, till the very aspect of humanity has been well nigh effaced, that even in them a spark of deity lies smouldering, which may yet break up this unlovely chaos, and transform it into shapes of beauty and life. But the mass have not yet realised this hope, they are as yet only beginning to stir with blind, uneasy motion, and a dim consciousness of uncertain strength. The tone of flattery assumed towards the people, in all the books, poems, lectures and talk that goes on about them at the present time, the endeavour to create sympathy with them at the expense of the higher classes, the fashion it has grown to exploiter the lower orders, is not precisely the wisest method to form the race, which will in all likelihood form the main element in the next generation of society. Nothing is so demoralising as making a fashion of a principle. The mass needs civilising, 
and nothing can be more vulgar than the tone in which they are addressed. Bad taste is a sin, always symptomatic of something more deeply seated. From the beginning of the world, there have been disorganised periods, when the institutions that had heretofore held society together and sufficed for the general governance and guidance of the people have fallen into dissolution. New social elements have manifested themselves, and the opinions, manners, political institutions, and the whole machinery of society have crystallised afresh. The industrial classes are the new element of our own day. They contain the germ of the next generation. The preponderance of unworn strength and undeveloped vitality rests with them. They are a phase of society that has never, in any age, been presented. The tone and measure of the next age depend mainly on the impulse given to this as yet unorganised mass. Their tendencies are at present altogether material. Their strength, rough sagacity and uncivilised capacity have no ideal or poetical sympathies. One word they have adopted as their motto and designation, they are practical and set no value on any qualities that are not practical. In this world, with so much rough work lying on all sides and emphatically needing to be done, to be practical in the application of one's faculties is certainly highly desirable. Still the Apostles' words hold true that the things which are seen are temporal and that the fashion of this world passeth away. The most important element of a man's life is that which cannot be seen and of which none but himself can take cognizance. If he be taught to have faith only in the things that be seen, felt and made manifest, he has but a poor, starved lookout, either for this life or the next. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of things which he possesses, but in the divine thought by which he shapes it, and this alone magnifies it and makes its worth. The spirit in which a man lives is more important than anything that he does. To endure as believing that which is invisible is the highest order of life. The lower and less perfectly organised a man is, the more material is he in his desires and his belief, the less capable of being inspired by the wisdom that is above all things. The industrial classes, from their position, are thrown mainly amongst material things. Some have to wrestle to compel their actual subsistence from a hand-to-hand -hand conflict with starvation, a struggle that has to be renewed day by day. Those who are not au prise with circumstances for their means of life are engrossed in business, a still more materialised process which has a fascination beyond that of gambling, no matter whether a man makes money by it or not. Others again are getting rich, the most vulgarising ordeal of all. All these stand in peculiar need to have a faith created in them for that which is invisible, a practical faith in principles and high motives, which, though impalpable to bodily sense, have still a real existence, and ought to shape all acts and deeds. The things which are seen are not made from those which do appear. That this contact with material cares and interests should be combated and neutralised by the cultivation of more ideal tendencies is a vital moment, not only to those whose souls are choked out of them by the cares of this world and the deceitfulness of riches, but to the very existence of society itself. And yet nothing of the sort is ever preached to the industrial classes. The tone that pervades the books and lectures of mechanics institutes, all that is addressed to them especially, is all pervaded by a low prosaic tone of speciality. Nothing higher than common sense is ever appealed to. They are never taught to rely on higher or more ideal qualities. They are told nothing that can arouse a noble enthusiasm. Everything they are exhorted to has some specific egoistic advantage. They are told to cultivate themselves, to seek truth and freedom and all that, but in what they consist or how they should be sought is left in the vague. They may listen in vain for a word of that inspiration which passes the understanding, burns the hearts within us and makes men greater than they know. 
they are never made passionate for that which is higher than themselves. No belief is encouraged, except for what can be demonstrated. The gross flattery which is addressed to the imperfect, undeveloped industrial class is enough to check their growth for ever. Subjects on which great men have not grudged to spend their life are reduced down to their level. A critical view and a general view, a course of lectures on the works of such and such great men, are all that is presented to them, and they are encouraged to fancy that in the space of an hour they are placed au niveau of the men who distilled their very souls in their labour. They are encouraged in a spirit of criticism instead of reverence, and where the spirit of criticism enters, the power of listening and profit never follows. An intense vulgarity is the distinguishing mark of the instruction addressed to the new order. There is a coarse provincial accent in the intellect which is intolerable, and entirely vitiates and demoralises it. The tendency of all mechanics institutes going, and of all mechanics institute literature, is to induce a puling, complacent consciousness in the mass and the million, a slang of philosophic culture, a brisk, pert, limited insight into truths which are cultivated like tulips in a row of red garden pots, clear, stiff, small and intentional, nothing left unaccounted for, nothing spontaneous, flowing or impulsive. All the books of that class of literature as tidy and trim as a Dutch garden. Every thought and fact is cleanly cut away from the infinite, swept up under its lawful definition, and the gravel walks are edged with cockle shells to prevent confusion. There are no temples, no long, solemn, shadowy aisles with many-coloured lights streaming across them. Perspective is no more believed in. Bald, bare architectural elevations are given instead. We had more to say, but to say it now would be to lengthen an article already perhaps too long. Another time we may say a few words on this disposition towards the intensely definite and visible. End of the Lower Orders by Geraldine Dewsbury End of Part 6「Part Seven of Geraldine Dewsbury in Gerald Schilling Magazine, 1846 to 1847. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Civilization of the Lower Orders. Published in Gerald Schilling Magazine, Volume Six, Number 35. A short time since, at a lyceum gathering in a manufacturing town of Lancashire, the chairman, in the course of his speech, observed that as the church, which ought to direct the people, had neglected to take the lead in the movement for instructing them, the people had got ahead of her, and that she must now be content to follow where the people led. We cannot undertake to swear to the exact words, but they were to the above effect. They are an average specimen of the tone in which it is the fashion to address the lower orders at these sort of anniversaries, and also of the general run of the books, literature and lectures specially addressed to them. To say nothing of its extreme bad taste, this sort of tone is eminently calculated to stunt the growth, to hinder the intellectual development, and to vulgarise the spirit of the new order, from whose unworn vitality and unexploited capabilities we look to see the face of the earth renewed. The lower orders are at the present time in a state of barbarism, and if a tone of self-glorification be encouraged in them, they will become emasculate and utterly incapable of the hard application and docile reverence which is essential to all who are in the condition of pupilage, and who would attain instruction of any degree of intrinsic worth. Self-cultivation is hard work, if it is to be worth anything. In discriminating praise, such as is administered to the people, induces self-complacency, and does not stimulate to painstaking exertion. The industrial classes have an immense distance to make up before they can stand in their right position with regard to the other orders of society who have for ages enjoyed the advantages of education and refining influences. 
they will not have assumed the position to which they are entitled until they become equal in refinement of manners and general instruction to those who now hold the position of their superiors. All legal and political disqualifications are done away with. All the old feudal distinctions have vanished. All trace of serfdom has disappeared from social institutions. But before the people can enjoy practical community of intercourse with those above them, they must be made their equals in fact as well as in theory. That is not to be done by flattering them and telling them that the disinclination of those in the higher ranks to associate familiarly with them arises from aristocratic pride, exclusiveness and contempt for those lowly born, nor by voting refinement to be a fine fancy, a superfluity, which the higher classes ought to do away with, instead of the lower orders being incited to attain it themselves. It is not a good spirit that is induced, but one altogether unworthy of the rising order. We are as good as you, is the motto they are encouraged to adopt. They flatter themselves and are flattered, till the atmosphere of their own reputation becomes so heated that no sobriety of judgment can sustain its life. It is from no want of sympathy with the industrial classes we speak thus, but we feel very jealous for them, and would have them take nothing lower than their appointed place. We would have them as excellent as brothers and equals, and not merely wonderful people considering their disadvantages. Those who are called on to take part in the work of civilising the lower orders must come to their task in the spirit of missionaries. They have to organise the crude rough mass which has been projected with volcano force into the bosom of our society. Whilst everything is still undeveloped, the spirit of those who influence the movement is of far more importance than their specific actions. Until the new growth have taken a deeper root and assumed a more declared shape, a spiritual element of soft and holy influences is the only fitting nourishment for it. It must grow and receive its shape from the life of heaven before men may venture to train it after their own notions. It seems to us that ever since the idea of educating the lower orders was entertained, there has been one great flaw in all the schemes for their instruction. The people have been treated as if they had been children of an inferior sort. All instruction has been reset in a commoner and coarser key for them. No spontaneity has been conceded to them. They have been considered a sort of block out of which everyone who chose was at liberty to try his hand at carving out a patent theory. Their beliefs, their hopes, their tastes have all been materialised after a theory of what the lower orders ought to be made. Before their minds were yet developed, they have been stiffened into an educational shape. There has been a crude, hard, barren artificialness in the tone addressed to them, a want of geniality, and there has resulted a sickly air of shabby gentility over all they have done, instead of the full, free, rustic humanity, full of freshness and strength, which ought to be the characteristics of the new order of men. When first the idea to educate the lower orders was started, they were still looked upon as serfs. The old feudal feeling had not disappeared. There are those who can still recollect the outcry that was raised against schools for the poor, the danger and inconvenience that would ensue to their masters and mistresses, and all who had to deal with them, if they were taught to read. And as to their learning to write, there was no end to the confusion and danger to both church and state that would follow their first attempts at pothooks and ladles. The higher classes had been so long accustomed to consider the lower orders as their property, to exploiter them for their own service and convenience, that they feared a first step which was likely to arouse them to a sense of their individuality and their rights. It was the inconvenience to themselves they feared. Those who first led the movement for teaching the poor to read and write were rather moved by a feeling of benevolence than by a recognition of the principle that the lower orders have the same right to be furnished with the means of instruction that they have to be kept from starvation. The higher classes are morally bound to instruct those beneath them who are not only unable to provide instruction for themselves, 
but who are not even enlightened enough to know what education means. The practical republicanism of trade had not then been developed. The people had not awoke to a sense of their own strength, nor to a recognition of their own rights. The great body of the lower orders were immediately dependent on the higher rank, as tenants, labours and retainers, who, with the instinct of self-preservation, shrank from making those in subjection, unruly or discontented, by opening any aspirations to them. However, the principle of teaching the poor was at length partially conceded. But even those who were the most zealous in this cause could only conceive it under strict limitations, and with the avowed intent of teaching them only what was necessary for poor people to know. "'Would you object to a poor man's reading his Bible?' cried the advocates for instruction. "'No,' replied the other side. "'But if you teach them to read, they will not be content with their Bible, but get to reading newspapers in public houses, and get idle, discontented, and unfit for their work. Those servants who can neither read nor write are much better workers than those who have had their head turned with such things.' The education of the lower class began with the idea that it was a rougher and inferior instruction to which they were to be limited. In these days it is curious to look back on the sort of books which were written for the people. Even those most anxious to teach were fully impressed with the importance of flavouring every idea communicated to the poor with emphatic submission in all things to the opinions of those in authority over them. The one all-pervading sentiment in the works of that period was a paraphrase on the right divine of kings, adjusted to a sliding scale of the different proportions in which a divinity might be supposed to hedge squires, magistrates, clergymen, and all the quality in general. Self-respect was a notion unheard of for the poor. Nothing could exceed the supercilious condescension and cold pomposity with which the people were addressed they were no more allowed to think or read above the station in which it had pleased God to place them than to dress above it. The old spirit of feudality, in a new guise, claimed the right of disposing of the slowly developing faculties of the mind, as it had formerly exacted the servitude of the body. It was the tribute expected for their education. The poor were forbidden to use their new privilege on their own account. All questionings were put down as signs of disaffection. They were enjoined to think as those who knew better, taught them. It is very odd, but it invariably happens, that when a fresh privilege is conceded to those below by those above, it is always granted, as the vicar of Wakefield gave the guinea to his daughters for pocket money, on no account to be spent. The first attempt to make use of a privilege always brings an outcry. To be in subjection to those only a very little wiser than ourselves is the most galling and intolerable of conditions. And liberty, once conceded, though only in theory, is very hard to take back, and so it has proved in this case. Those were the days when the French Revolution had spread dismay over the old order of things, and all connected with them. Entire and implicit subjection to the divine right of legitimacy was considered the only specific for preserving this country from the horrors of anarchy and bloodshed. Even a wealthy man of the better classes, who was suspected of a tendency to liberal notions, was regarded as a pestilent fellow, an infidel, disaffected to the constitution, and desiring only his own ends. He was placed under a social taboo, which entirely tarnished his respectability, that ambient crown of glory to an Englishman. If, therefore, the higher classes had little freedom of thought allowed to them, they were hardly competent to extend that blessing to those below them, or to entertain just ideas of the right of the lower orders to be considered as brothers and equals. But those who minister shall be ministered unto themselves in return, and it is by giving more enlarged views to the lower orders that the higher and middle classes have gained increased liberty for themselves both of thought and speech and action. There is, however, no more real amalgamation between the higher and lower classes than there was at first. The lower classes are as a body 
in a state of reaction against the intense civility which was formerly exacted from them as a mark of good character. The overstrained reverence for their betters is, now that they feel they are a body amongst themselves, taking the form of a cynical pride in not being gentlefolks. It is a devil which will need to be loved out of them, as a quaint old minister used to say. It is neither to be done by the flattery that would make them fancy great things of themselves, nor by the concise theories addressed to the working classes, as from an imaginary height, by those within the temple, to those still kept in the outer court. The higher classes must earn their fraternity with the lower, or, instead of brothers and friends, they will be powerful, dangerous and jealous rivals. At present there is an absence of fellow-feeling, an indescribable tone which prevents all amalgamation of feeling and sympathy between the classes, and keeps up the deep separation between them. They are a new class, imperfectly reclaimed, requiring to be cultivated and civilised, before they can amalgamate with the old classes and old civilization. They are the rude, uncultivated lower order now, but they are not to be kept so to the end of the world. There is nothing in the fact of their daily labour to disqualify them from being entirely civilised, and as thoroughly enlarged and enlightened in their opinions as any other class of society. Rude, uncouth and unlovely as they now are, in all their aspects, there they are, to be civilised and made fit for fellowship and community, till at length all classes become one, all raised to a higher level of humanity and there be no more high and low, but all dwelling together as brethren. The practical republicanism of trade has forever emancipated the lower orders from a condition of permanent inferiority. The great bulk of the current wealth of the country is now in the hands of an entirely different class of people to those who held it formerly. In fact, all the new resources for amassing wealth are in the hands of the middle class, which is in great measure recruited from those who have risen from the ranks. The middle and lower classes are every day becoming more fused into one large body, the standard of which is money. Wealth is a great tangible fact, which can control all that depends on human skill and industry. He who has money can always make it worth men's while to work for him. Wealth is a great unlimited, undefined possibility, there is hardly anything it cannot do for its possessor. The wealth of the country has changed hands within the last fifty years. At least it has accumulated more rapidly in the hands of a class much lower than those who held it formerly. The distinctions of birth and family are incomprehensible in commercial towns and manufacturing districts, where there is no distinction except of rich and poor. A great proportion of the men have either risen from the ranks themselves, or their fathers before them did so. It is quite common to find the near connections and relations of wealthy merchants and mill owners quite poor and ill off, while the more fortunate members live in houses like palaces, surrounded by all the glories that money or upholstery can furnish, without having in the least degree lost the uncultivated habits of the people. Poverty is the only practical evil the lower orders have to struggle against. If they are poor, they are in a condition of bodily discomfort and squalid misery, which it is fearful to contemplate as existing in a civilised land. The houses of the poor people in England, says one well capable of judging, are worse than the prisons described by Howard in his time. But that misery is not entailed on the class, and has no discreditable significance beyond its actual wretchedness. The position of the old English gentry has changed from what it used to be. If one enters an old country church, we find it filled with monuments of old-fashioned country families who used to live on their own estate and be looked up to with respect by the whole country round a hundred years ago. We find that they are now passed away, the family mansion, it may be, let for a school, or, at any rate, gone amongst strangers. The old stock itself either extinct or diminished and brought low, 
unable to assert itself, and the new order of influences against the new race that has arisen. The descendants of those old respectable families will often be found in subordinate situations, perhaps in the employment of those whose forefathers were servants to their grandfathers. To belong to an old family, unless the family inheritance goes with it, brings little consideration in these days. The recent railway movement has shown that the title deeds to an immense portion of the landed property of Great Britain have passed into the hands of the newly arisen order. If good Sir Simon Dewis could come back to life again, he would go well nigh distracted at the confusion and presumption of the fancy coat armours rampant on so many new shields. A knowledge of their fathers and grandfathers is in these days the wisdom of the minority. The realities of life rest at present chiefly with the middle and lower classes. The moral force, the mass of wealth, and the preponderance of hard, strong, matter-of-fact knowledge lies with them. Theirs is the very antipodes of beautified, exotic, drawing-room existence. Labour is not beautiful in its aspect, never has been beautiful. It is stern, rugged, difficult, presenting no affinities with the refined and delicate influences of life amongst the higher classes. And yet, it is absolutely necessary for the well-being of the men belonging to both that the two classes should be reconciled in their sympathies. This is the grand social problem that has yet to be solved. The men belonging to the mercantile and industrial orders rise every morning with a definite task before them for the day, work that imperatively requires to be done, which takes their whole time and tasks their whole energies. Their whole time and energy is absorbed in the management of concerns, larger or smaller as the case may be, but which often involve the well-being of an immense number of persons. The men employed by them are so many machines, but the lowest porter in the establishment is separated from the head of it only by the accident of position and by no inherent disability. If he have capacity, he may attain anything. Masters and men form one large class together, but there is yet a class who are virtually a lower order still, below that we have named. They are becoming every day of more importance, because they are every day growing more aware of their own individuality, and feel less reverence for those above them. They are linked with the wealth and civilization of the country, though they themselves are neither wealthy nor civilized. They are the people who benefit the least by their emancipation from serfdom. They have the full right to manage themselves and their own affairs, but they have neither the wisdom nor the means of guiding themselves. They are half children, half savages, helpless and ignorant. They are rude, brutal, steeped in misery to the very lips. They have no love nor sympathy with those above them. Their wisdom is of the kind designated by St. James as earthly, sensual, devilish. It is a vulpine, egoistic fear of being taken in. In good times, when all goes smoothly and trade prospers, there is little danger from them. They are not incited to discontent, but an outbreak from the mass lying at the very bottom of society would be very terrible and fatal to all who have established any stake for themselves in the world. They are altogether unfit and unable to guide themselves, and are capable of being very dangerous under any extraordinary pressure or excitement. At first sight, one would be tempted to consider a mild slavery to enlightened masters the most compendious way of providing for this semi-rational mass, so that they might be taken care of, and provided for like domestic animals, and redeemed from their sordid misery to a life of reasonable comfort. That is not the solution of the difficulty, nor the manner in which any class would be justified in dealing with a social problem. The task is far more difficult. They must be taught and educated and civilised. Ready-made animal comforts provided for men, without any thought or foresight of their own, enervates them, destroys the root of all energy and manliness within them, degrades them to the rank of cattle. 
but though those above them are not bound to conduct their worldly affairs for them, they are bound to see that they have instruction and means of acquiring the necessary practical skill for themselves. What is everybody's business is nobody's business, says the proverb, and what is left to the optional and voluntary efforts of those who may feel their conscience moved will not be adequately done. To civilise a mass like the lowest orders in this country requires a well-digested and imperative system to educate and civilise an entire class, effectively to raise them to the rank of rational beings, cannot be done by the efforts of amateur benevolence, and never will get done by those means. A government ought to be the focus of the enlightenment and wisdom of a country. It has the unlimited command of all needful means for the best mode of instructing and civilising those who have no means of getting instruction for themselves, who are too brutishly ignorant to know whether there be such a thing as education. However desirable it may be that the other classes should cooperate for the benefit of their ignorant brethren, still, the responsibility of seeing that the work is done rests entirely on a government, and no theory can transfer the burthen to others. No voluntary undertaking can ever be made imperative, and in a case of such supreme importance, optional goodwill and efforts are not adequate to the work in hand. We are not going to set up a theory of education on the best mode of civilising the lower orders. Education and civilization are sciences which require patient sagacity to work out into practice. But one thing is certain, that something more solid and systematic than lectures and lyceums is required for the great work of civilising the mass of our lower orders and making them rational, well-regulated members of the community. Missionaries, able to teach and lead those rude, half-savage and wholly ignorant beings, full of a spirit of love and wisdom and a sound mind, are wanted for this work. Mere schoolmasters and schoolmistresses are not equal to the task. More is required, energy and zeal and a passionate yearning love for the multitude, ready to perish, and a disposition to spend and be spent, to dedicate all their powers to redeem the souls of these outcasts, dwelling in misery. Who is sufficient for these things? Who will arise amongst us and offer themselves for this work? Let the government, let the people join together. There is enough to task the power of both. They are not separate powers, they are one, and they are wishing to bring in amongst them those yet lying desolate and forlorn on the outskirts of humanity. End of the Civilization of the Lower Orders by Geraldine Dewsbury End of Part 7 End of Geraldine Dewsbury in Gerald's Schilling Magazine 1846-1847 Read by Phil Benson in Sydney, Australia